Hi, this is Ken Jureski, and today we're talking pictures with legendary photo editor Karen Malarkey. We've talked to her before. Uh, you know her, you love her, and I love her too. Hi, Karen. How you doing? Hi. Hello, Ken. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I'm out here in nowhere's land, but you're you're in the the Big Apple. How how are things there? I'm in the epicenter. Yeah. Um, I actually sat outside a little bit today with my mask and my gloves and my hazmat suit and um, watched people go by. Um, most people are wearing a mask and gloves. And uh, I only had one homeless person try to accost me, which was, but he had a mask. God knows where he picked it up. It was around his neck as opposed to his face. And I asked him to move right along and he did. He was very good. And um, I think, you know, other than, you know, every night at seven o'clock, we go to our window and I take my Tibetan gong uh, singing bowl and bang that. And people scream and rant and rave. And I saw two nurses coming by off a shift today uh, on their way, I hope, I guess, to the subway, which is nearby. And they were coming from uh, Beth Israel. So it's, you know, we're doing the best we can and we're, you know, you just take it at one day at a time and sure. you try not to be, you know, it's just like, um, it's like Groundhog Day. Right. Every day is the same day and you do have to tell yourself what day is it. And if I didn't have to take pills on certain, you know, every day, I, that keeps me grounded because I can see on the top of the pill jar, you know, the thing, <laughs> dispenser, what day it is. And I'm going, oh, my God, it's Saturday already. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I'm doing okay because I get to, I, I still am working with my students at the City University and I'm doing it via Zoom. So I see people every day that way, which is most right. helpful. So, um We've been talking kind of on this show, we've been talking a lot about the importance of a photo editor. And you were at the, speaking of being in the epicenter, you were in the center of that world for, I don't know, 40 years or so. And do you miss it now? Do you miss not uh, having a magazine to 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 get out on, on Friday night? You know, a little bit, because I think of the... Uh, because you want to make an assignment in an event like this, right? You want to be working. You want to be trying to publish uh, good work. You're looking for different kinds of work. Um, I have one student who's, uh, that I uh, coach uh, who's done some remarkable work. And if I were at Newsweek, I would run it. Lots of it. Because no one has done anything like it. Um, so I miss that part, you know, you're, I'm a bit like a Dalmatian who's been left behind in the firehouse. When events happen, I start automatically to make assignments and think of who I would send and how much I love going through work and the excitement of it all. And being surprised when you, for me, of course, most of it was slides, but being surprised when you opened the box. That was a wonderful experience. Why, why is that? Why is that so important to uh, not just on a magazine level, on a publication level, but 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 what does that mean as far as uh, having a national dialogue or, or or talking about important things that are happening around us? Well, I, I think it's important because you know it's you're providing a service. You're allowing people to see things they might not ever see. I mean, the thing about a national news magazine is it was everywhere and it was overseas and it was in Asia and it was in Europe. And so, you know, you were being able to show people things they might not see. And I don't care if they thought they saw it on TV. It's really different looking at a still picture because it really burns into your brain and you spent, you can linger on it. You can spend time on it and you can go back and look at it again and again. Uh, television it's fleeting it's gone well, how, does, how, how does how does how does that compare to to how we see most of our our news photos today i mean instagram's kind of like tv isn't it well i think it is unless you keep wanting to go i mean it's there and then 
unless and it goes so fast it, it, everything's so fast nowadays that i i miss that that thing where you could wait and before you turn you got to physically turn the page as opposed to the page being turned for you uh it's a subtle difference but i think an important one so you could leave the magazine open and really look at something and spend some time with it and you would read at the same time the story and then you would turn the page so it was a lot uh slower and more deliberate experience and that uh, just the act of paging through that physical magazine doesn't oh, it? it it's, it's kind of a, it's a subtle little trick that makes people uh, it forces them to actually look at the image a little longer and absorb it, doesn't it? Oh yeah, it does. And and it's tactile. I, it, you know, touch is involved as well as sight. And then, of course, there's reading, so now your brain is working on that level of digesting words. But, I mean, I love having the Sunday Times that I can uh, turn pages and, and, and find stories I didn't know I was interested in. Something that would catch my eye. And I was like, wow, you know? And uh, so that's what I was doing when I was out in front of the house on my little folding chair <laughs> with my cushion i had the sunday paper part of the sunday paper and i would read something and then i would play a, a word game in the crossword puzzle and i would go back and read something else and then i would you know let's look at the metropolitan section and you know what are they recommending in the book review so there's that whole thing about you know searching for information um and you're being in charge of the search. It's different when you get to Instagram and you suddenly, you know, one thing right after another, and then, uh, and then it's gone. And I, it's that thing about everything's so temporary. <laughs> so when when you when you're laying out a magazine like Newsweek, I mean, what do you got? A hundred, hundred and twenty, depending on the advertising, you might have a hundred pages to work with. Right. On a fat week. Do you think about that when you're going through the editing process? Oh, that God, this yeah. is a, a curated experience and you're yeah, trying. Yeah. Tell me about that. Well, first of all, you know, you've had your morning meetings all week and you know what the lead story is going to be and you have an idea of the cover. I mean, that can all change on a Friday night and often did if news broke. But, you know, so you already know your lead, what we used to call it the violin and the cello. <laughs> the violin was the lead and the cello was the second story. Uh, when I first got there, I thought we were doing orchestra pieces, but that was okay. <laughs> you know, every magazine has its own moment, you know, little private language. But so you, yeah, you think about what's my lead, what's going to be, what can I fight for to be a, a big photo spread? What do I have to offer that uh, maybe is in the back of the book or, or something? That, what international story do I have up my sleeve that deserves more pages and more pictures than two? Right. So, I mean, Newsweek is a different kettle of fish because it's a news magazine and it had to um, move a lot of information. Whereas starting at life, there were big wells, big feature wells is what we call them. And, you know, there'd be major stories that had been planned. So, I mean, that was, excuse me, a magazine that ran many more pictures. So I, 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 I hate to interrupt you here, but I, 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 I want to try to figure out that idea of a concert and playing this performance and giving the viewer, the listener, this complete experience. And so with something like Life Magazine, you might have three or four like key essays in that issue, but you had a lot of uh, secondary kind of pieces or refrains and uh -huh. you don't wanna keep pounding the viewer over the head with you know, the baseline you want to tell a complete story and you want to have a complete experience. And that's something you can do in a printed magazine, which you can't really do uh, right. on an Instagram or a Facebook. It, what's, that is uncurated space. Yeah. And, and besides which, you, there's a flow to it. So some stories, really what you're looking for is that one image that would, you know, it's a, in a Newsweek, it would be looking for that great two column horizontal that would lead you into the story. And you know, then the subhead would feed off of the picture kind of thing. So there's a, you know, there's there were different 
there were different reasons for running pictures in each of the magazines I worked for, and each one had a different conceit. Okay, so at like a news magazine, Newsweek, it was to tell you as many news stories as it could. Uh, and so as you got into the nation section, the, the opening would be the violin. That would maybe have quite a number of pictures. The second story might only have two or three. Then the others were just short pieces that were to, you know, kind of grab your attention and there'd be a single image, right? And then you'd get to the next section, which was foreign. And again, the lead story would have a splash of, of images. Now that was run very differently than life. And life, you know, always had a great cover story. But the front of the book were usually a, a series of quick takes on things, right, to get you into the magazine. And there were columns by Claude Wainwright and Joan Didion wrote a column when I was there. And, uh, Shana Alexander, these columns were up front, and then they led into the kind of the, the first story, which much of the time was Vietnam when I was there, would be the lead story. And then from that, it would, you know, you'd work your way back, and then there was the food stories, and there was, you know, fashion, and then you'd get big wells of pictures. It was, you know, this kind of, um, you know, from when it was started, it was kind of like the television was coming into your house every week. And so it was there to give you a well-rounded idea of great stories and things that were going on everywhere. Newsweek is a different kettle of fish. It's a different uh, reason for being. And it's, so a, a publication has a personality. Oh, gosh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it has a, and it has a reason for being. And it must stay true to what its ethic is, its ethos is. It has to stay true to that. And if it goes off line too much, it loses who it is. It has a personality. Magazines have certain person. Each one has its own personality. Where does that personality, it doesn't necessarily come from the managing editor. Sometimes it's in the DNA. It's baked in somehow. Yeah, Where does well, it come from? I think it's baked in from when it was founded. Life was founded to be a picture magazine. That's what its job was. Time was founded to be a news magazine with many stories, quickly take quick takes, not huge long pieces necessarily, ones that would kind of condense the events of the week. Fortune was to be a much more uh, rich, uh, that was a luxury. That was a luxury vehicle. Absolutely, really. and had extraordinary artwork in it right. in the beginning. I mean, that's where I mean they ran um, Dorothea Lange's pictures. You know, I mean that. So they had an incredible history. You know, People Magazine was just what it was. It was to be a gossip magazine that um, was a little dressed up. But, but see, though, so the, in the interesting thing about Life Magazine, it had all those things you just said. Yes. Uh, it had gossip. It certainly had, you know, Raquel oh. Welch uh, entertaining the troops in Vietnam. That might be your Vietnam story that week. Uh, it, it would be uh, Shirley MacLaine at home with her daughter. Yes. That, that's a be, that would be in the living section. There was a food section. There was fashion. There was living. There was art. There was a science section that was always avant-garde. That's where Leonard Nielsen's pictures of fetuses first ran. Right. Yeah, it was the anniversary this, this week of the, that essay, I believe. Oh, is it? I believe so. I, David, David Friend tweeted something out, I, I think. Oh, God. I'm telling you, he was the uh, most interesting man. They paid him in goods because um, the taxes were so high <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, he needed a stove. We would buy him a stove. You know, that kind of thing. We could buy him goods. That's how he got a lot of, his, a lot of the payment. Need a new TV, Leonard? <laughs> how about a car <laughs> need a car oh well, anyway I, I i mean it's it's fascinating to me and, and and i suppose if you if you talk to uh talk to any publisher or any business person today they'd probably tell you uh tv killed life magazine and you could never do something like that again that'd be the short answer right well, that's not the answer. 
I mean, that's not necessarily what killed it. Uh, you know, what killed it was uh, they decided to buy all the subscription lists from Look, and they got so that they couldn't make, they had to, they were printing in many ways, it was too expensive to mail it, is what was more about what it was about. Plus, which, of course, they had pissed off Nixon. And uh, so postal rates and things like that went up. And as he threatened to do with the Me Lai story, he threatened to do that. And he kept his threat. I mean, uh, you know, Andrew Haskell, High School, I guess his name, I can't try to remember his last name. He was the head of the whole thing. And he basically told them to go jump in the lake. And he, they ran the story. But, uh, you know, they paid for it. And, you know, I don't know that TV killed it. I mean, after all, Television was around all through the 60s, and it was still, it was going really well. I just think there was a certain amount of mismanagement. There always is after a while. It's inevitable. There's cycles for everything. That's how I look at it. You know, everything kind of runs its cycle. And then it's off to the, you know, for me, it was always off to what's the next interesting wave to ride. So, you know, from life to get to go to Rolling Stone, you know, I stopped off at Psychology Today, but, you know, then, you know, Rolling Stone was its own uh, wonderful experience, but it's, it's not really relevant these days. The, the great writing that it had isn't. The great photography that it had isn't. So, I, I, you know, I think things have a cycle. I do. Well, what, what do, uh, you know, if we, if we picked up, if I went to the digital version of Rolling Stone right now, people would say, oh, look at all these great pictures. And that would be the majority of, of the viewers would say, oh, there's nothing wrong with these pictures. Look, at, this, is, this is my favorite actor. This is my favorite musician and whatever. But there's something, be, there's something, magical that happens uh when you have a great image and I, I, we'll look at some here but can you can you what's the difference between a lot of images and one great image on the pages of a, of a magazine well i think when they're really special they just they stay with you you don't forget them they're just burned in your brain. And so the, I'm not saying that people aren't making good pictures now for Rolling Stone. I don't, I don't look at it partly because my musical taste sort of stopped in 1969. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't, you know, I'm not into the, you know, it doesn't speak to, it isn't my audience anymore. It isn't, it doesn't, you know, I might, might be a political piece I hear about that I would read, but I would not, on a regular basis uh go there i mean i think the new york times is running extraordinarily great photographs i mean you know i think michelle mcnally when she was at the times just kind of blew the lid off and i think megan lorem is doing a very good job following me. she was trained by michelle she's she knows her business so i mean there are places where you're seeing really fine art and i i get the paper on the weekend but during the week, I read the Times online, and I read the Post, on Washington Post, and Marianne Golan and and uh, Brown and Latimer are doing a really fine job down there. But you know, I think it's tough to beat the Times. Visually, it's really tough because their their multimedia stuff is spectacular, really good, and that's a fun way to look at things. And uh, there's you know, I I look forward to it. And so um, I have no problem looking at things online. I just, I want it to uh, be, I want it to be so exciting that I don't want to leave that page. That I want to go back and look at those pictures over again. That I want to spend time with them. I think that's the sign of a good photograph. You want to spend time with it. You want, yeah, you that's, that's, what I, that, that, that's what I was going to say, that image that you, that forces you to go back and look at it again. Yeah, and again. Right. Multiple times. Right. Because there's so much information in it that the first time you look at it, you can't you can't process all of it at once. Right. And so 
that's when you know it's successful is when you have to go back a couple of times to look at it again and then you see something you hadn't quite seen before right so i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna show some of your work and um I think there'll be some great images in here that force us to look at them. Well, but, so let's start with this one caveat. I never shot any of these pictures. So I want everybody to understand that. My job, particularly at life, was I was learning my way. And so um, I happened to have the great good fortune of, let's say, in the astronauts to be part of that team. Uh, you know, the Vietnam War. I was there, I was working for Dick Pollard. I met all, I knew all these photographers. I knew them well. And I, they were, many of them were my teachers. But nobody mistake this, that it's my work is, I was lucky. I look upon myself as the most fortunate person to have been at these particular magazines at the time I was at them, which was turned out to be, in most cases, their heyday. Oh, I no, see. I wasn't. I wasn't saying. I wasn't okay. trying to imply that these yeah. are your photographs. I'm trying. Right. What I'm trying to apply is is that uh, it's a it's a team effort, and you you work with brilliant photographers. Oh, brilliant. And um, part of your job is e even when you're just kind of like the helping hand at Life Magazine when you first started out there. Uh, part of your job is to help great photographers yes. become better and mm -hmm. squeeze the most out of them that you can right that's right absolutely true and did you do that were you good at that i was pretty good at that <laughs> i i know some photographers who could tell you i could squeeze pretty tight <laughs> not yeah. always did they like that but they responded well to it and well, that's, uh, that's that's an interesting point because um each photographer has their different uh, buttons to push and you had to kind of kind of be a, 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 a maybe you picked that up working for psychology today i don't know <laughs> well i actually picked it up at life when i started because i watched how mr pollard did it and he was a, a master in me, respecting a, a, a love and discipline and being available and unavailable. And he knew just what buttons to push to get people to um, outperform what they thought they could do. That's and that's always point. the secret, that's, that's the secret. Right, because I know as, as a photographer, I could, I, could, I could shoot something and think, you know, I've, I've done my absolute best, there's nothing more to be had here and then have a photo editor make me uh, go back and give it another go, you know, not because uh, I thought there was anything there, but th because they thought there was something more to be had there. Yes. And then you went back and found it. Yeah, much to my chag chagrin. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell photographers, listen, I think this was a really good sketch. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get out the paint now and go paint the goddamn picture. It's a nice drawing, but I need to see it. Right? You sketched it out nicely. <laughs> you know, all great artists sketch before they paint, except for, you know, Jackson Pollock. But, you know, it's sort of the kind of way that I looked upon it. It's a good first run at it. There's more to be done. So I, I I think this was I don't know if this picture was made by Neil Armstrong or not, but it, it could have been. Um, uh, it certainly it could have been, or yeah, it could have been made by Buzz Aldrin actually. Right. Well, they're both in the frame. They're both and, in the frame, so I can't tell you which one is which because right. I don't think they have their names on their back. But it may well have been Neil because he was first out there. So did you give them any tips, or you just kind of let them do their do their thing? <laughs> I gave them no tips. But I bet Ralph Morse did. I bet he did I would too. Think, I bet Ralph did. I'm right. sure. I'm sure of it. He talked photography to these guys all the time. Yeah, and they were pretty smart guys as as well as well as hot shots. They were they were pretty pretty smart guys. They could pick up a, a very a smart fellows. Quick. We would have to say they were quick learners. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, so this is Larry Burroughs and you know, you're, you're deeply connected to the Burroughs family. And so tell me, this is Yankee Papa 13 and it's That's one of the correct. most famous essays, uh, probably that has ever run anywhere and certainly uh, one of the right. most impactful. Tell me about it. People have tried to copy it, but it never can be as powerful as this. That was the moment he realized who the person was, that he was a friend. Yeah, this Larry Burroughs was really the dean of, of Vietnam photographers. He was an extraordinary man. Very, um, he never would be the kind of person that strutted around and I'm Larry Burroughs and you're not. He was not, that was not who he was. You know, he'd been a lab assistant. You know, he, he'd been a grunt in terms of photography. And uh, I always adored it when he came in for home leave. It was so exciting because, you know, most of these guys sent their film in on process. So they didn't really know what they had until it ran in the magazine, until they talked to Peggy Sargent and her crew, who were the photo editor at the, at the magazine. And he would, then they would come in for home leave twice a year and they would sit in the funny little room where I had been sent to, you know, gather pictures and learn my craft and they would sit in there and go through all their film and they'd already been they went down the picture collection they knew what had run then they went to the picture collection to see everything that had been selected by the picture collection and then they came up to that little room in the back and went through all the reject film they went through every single box so That's you like just that. you described uh your early training to me once about having to go through those boxes after they'd been gone through three or four times right. and still uh, find, find a kernel there, uh, you know, a diamond in the rough or something like right. that. A pearl. A pearl. A pearl among the rocks. Right. So um, just give me a little idea of what that was like to have these great photographers um, go through their own contact sheets after not seeing them for, you know, six months, having the story run. Were there, uh, were there some disagreements involved at the final oh, yeah, selection? sure. And sometimes they found things, uh, Larry found some things once, uh, more than once, I'm sure, in the reject rejects that had been missed because, you know, you're just a human being. So inevitably there's going to be things you'll miss. You know what I mean? You can't see, you're not, nobody's 100% correct all the time so but when, but, but when you look at yankee papa 13 in its original form in the magazine and you could say that about like bill epridge's uh you know we're animals or um these they didn't have a whole lot of say in the editing process at that point but they kind of hold together pretty strongly after even 50 oh, yeah. years you know absolutely and you know the the women, they were all women who were the photo editors at Life. Peggy Sargent was the, the head person, and there was Barbara Brewster, and I, I wish I could remember the other two ladies' names. And it was always the, where, what women did there. Women were allowed to be the photo editors. They could be researchers. You know, this is 1968, 67, so, you know. But Peggy missed very little, I'll promise you that. She was tough and she was smart and she was fast. And the photographers had the utmost respect for her. Utmost. And she, that she'd call, you know, they'd call in from wherever they were to find out and she'd tell them, this worked, this didn't work, this was amazing. This has a cover and six pages inside. She was right there through the whole thing. She'd fight for pictures. She, she was a, quite a remarkable woman. Somebody should have done a, a story about her a long time ago because she was quite, quite extraordinary. Yeah, we've, we've talked about her in the past, and she's a, a famous name. That's uh, it's sadly kind of just, you know, we don't we don't know a whole lot about her because she didn't tell us a whole lot. But no, oh, she wouldn't know. The uh, the idea, I think, that you kind of you kind of brushed across something that was pretty important. Yeah. She, you know, the photographers would uh, call her up and, and she would tell them where they, where they succeeded and where they failed. And that's kind of, it's kind of that 
it's not really tough love, but it's a, there's a trust being built there that a photographer can go out and risk their life halfway around the world. And they have this trust that there's this person back in civilization who um, is doing right by them. Not only that, who will tell them the truth. That's I mean, extremely it, important, you know. I think it's extremely important that photographers under, get the truth from whomever it is that they're working for. So that there's none of this, yeah, no, fine. it was fine. What was that mean? <laughs> it was fine. You know? Either it worked or it didn't work. What? And if it didn't work, why didn't it work? What could be done to fix it? What's missing? This is a great picture. This is by Henri Hue, uh, AP photographer. Larry Burroughs saw this because the AP guys could, uh, my cat has come to visit. Yeah. <laughs> That's Max. Hi, Max. It's a good thing you're here. Um, we wouldn't know what to do without you. And um, so Larry saw this because Henri was with uh, the Associated Press. And of course, they processed their film there. And the minute he saw it, he called life and said, this has to be the cover, not my picture, this picture. So that's an interesting little thing that, uh, you know, the, the AP office in, in, in Saigon, that was kind of a place where you'd run into everybody, even the UPI photographers now and then, I'm guessing. Yeah, and both places, because, I mean, Sneed was the UPI bureau chief, Bill Sneed, at that time. And... Horace Foss, I think, was the uh, guy for AP. And, um, you know, sometimes Eddie would be, Eddie Adams would fight with Horace, so he would go to, he'd go over to Sneed and have Sneed edit his film. <laughs> you know, there was all that stuff that went on there that was, but they were one family. I mean, they were highly competitive. They, you know, Eddie always wanted to beat Dirk. Dirk always wanted to beat Eddie. But at the same time, they were, they were one family and they had each other's back. So this is an extraordinary picture. Isn't it? Oh, we this talked is, about uh, Bill. Yeah, this is Bill Epperidge took this picture shot in Oregon, actually. And it ran with the date of June 14th, but it actually was on the stands prior to Bobby being murdered. And it, cause we, the magazine was there, like say, like on a Monday. So this so, was the week before the assassination. This is days before the assassination. Wow! Because it carried a cover date of the fourteenth, but that wasn't the real date. It came out a a week earlier. Right. Bobby was shot on I think it's the like sixth or the seventh, something like that of June, and so this was out before. So this was the cover that was on the stamps. When Bob was shot, when Senator Kennedy. Was I mean, shot. that's that's. I didn't know that, Karen. That's pretty spooky because yeah. um, this is a goodbye picture. Any yeah. anybody with any yeah. photographic, you know, a cinematographer, a director would tell you this is like the last shot. You know. Right. Well, and this was in Oregon, and he lost that primary to McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy. But then he was on his way, and he knew he was losing. Right. And but the next stop was California. So he was on his way to California. This was the last hurrah in uh, in Oregon and on his way down to California to campaign. And they used this without having, obviously. And then. Um, and then he was murdered on a Tuesday. I mean, it, it's it's eerie, right? I mean, it's yeah. kind of scary, isn't it? But it's a, such an amazing picture. He's totally airborne. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bill was a pretty good sports photographer. He was a wonderful sports photographer. He was a wonderful photographer. Yeah, he could shoot everything. Anything and everything. Yeah. He loved to shoot sailing. You know, he was really great at the uh, uh, America's Cup. He sure. Loved it. it was really good. So this is an Annie picture uh -huh. from Rolling Stone. Annie Leibovitz. Annie Leibovitz in 1975 on a very famous tour, the 75 tour, which was Crazy Town. Back to back Crazy Town all the time. All the time. So it's a wonderful, 
It's a wonderful picture. I mean, it's got a, it's 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 a pretty good cover. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right there, right at you, both of them, right on you. Both of them talking to her with their eyes. Yeah. I love this one. It's one of my favorites. This Linda Ronstadt shot by Annie Leibovitz, and um, this was the one where she and I had talked about. You know, we'd done a lot of covers of of Linda and I kept saying I was so tired of seeing her in cutoffs like she was she's not some kid anymore I said and she had done that wonderful album which was all standards and everything else and I said you know she's an adult and she should you know let's make her what she is you know she's very sexy but so we came up with this idea of the uh, of the teddy the red teddy and I said, but we have to have a cross, you know, she's Catholic, but I still, you know, I said, you know, it's that Madonna whore thing. <laughs> Every man's fantasy. So let's do it. And so she got the outfit and it was just supremely successful and everybody went cuckoo bananas for it. She loved it. How much, how much of a concept do you come up with as a, with the photographer as a, as a, well, it depends, you know, it depends on the, for, you know, a couple of things we would, just talk about stuff and laugh about things and come up with silly ideas, you know, like Dolly Partner, which is later on, you know, you know, I just said to her in passing that I thought Dolly had a bigger chest than Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and Arnold, I had, was aware of because Annie uh, had done him, you know, as a, I'm, I'm just going to go, I'm going to fast forward because you're, I know it's in here somewhere. I hope it's in, ah, uh, I'm ruining it. Ah. Uh. Go back. You'll f we'll find it. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. So that, that was the story, you know, and uh, it, it comes up later. But anyway, it was just, she had done Arnold and his last Mr. Olympia thing. So that's how I knew about him and stuff. And, you know, George Butler's movie. Anyway, so this was just an idea. And she went with it, ran with it, and did a brilliant, her usual brilliant job. Right? I mean, there's, there, it's a, it's a true portrait because there, it's a, it's, it's a collaborate. You, you can, you can see Linda is, is, is working with the photographer to really. She, she loved it. Right. She loved the whole concept. I'm sure she dropped the, the strap. Yeah, I that's not an accident. So I can't tell you if Annie said to her, drop that strap or if it, Linda got it and just shrugged it off. I would not be surprised if Linda had just done that. But so, it was perfect. Tell me about the brainstorming process, these ideas, well, you know, you're sitting around, you're having a, a drink, whatever, but it's kind of, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of a safe space for lack of a better word, where you can just throw out crazy ideas. Is that correct? Really? And that was the whole point. I mean, there are no dumb ideas because one is going to lead to another one. This is just a silly story. The reason I have this in is because Jan had a crush on Peter Frampton. And we had a totally different cover. And then at halfway through he, the run, he changed it. So that it would be this one with his shirt off. That's the only reason. This is my own private joke. Okay. I mean, we've got three Rolling Stone covers, and I think we got one Teddy in, in three covers. And that's it right. for clothing and a, and a vest. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Well, now you can see where we were. And what, and what was the look of the time, right? Yeah. I, I, this right, is see, a, there's still there's still a lot of clothes missing here. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, this is Annie, and um, she shot this down in Australia, where they were, where Fleetwood Mac were, and that's when I decided I would leave the magazine because it was easier with her out of the country. And uh, <laughs> so that's when that all began to happen. And then she came back, and she was not happy. She was not happy. But it's a yeah, it's a classic because everybody Fleetwood Mac was sleeping with everybody else. So he, you know, what can I tell you? Stevie so Nicks. is this, is this a concept or is this a happy accident or how does this come across? Oh no, this would be an Annie concept. Okay. I'm positive. You know, I wasn't there because it was taken out of the country. Right. But I would tell you, I'm positive the minute you know it came out and we minute we saw it, that would absolutely. It's, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it's a no-brainer oh, for a right. cover. I mean, it's like yeah. too easy. And um, she knew which this time, you know, 
she just had it down pat. Right. And so what year is this, like 75-ish? No, oh, this is... Um, 77, 78? 77, 78, I think okay. it's 78, maybe, 77. Is Rolling Stone in New York at that point? Yeah, it, well, this says March. I can't read the date, but we moved, <clears throat> we moved there in um, June of 1977. Okay, so you, you could just be in New York at this point. The reason I ask is, uh, personally, of selfish reasons, I want to know... Does Annie fly business or first class at this point working oh, for Rolling lucky Stone? Lucky to get business. Lucky to get business, seriously. Lucky to get business. No, I, I figured as much. I didn't even want to suggest no, it. No, no, no. That's a 16-hour flight. I know. Maybe she talked you on into business, but never first class. I mean, he moved to New York to make money, but he's still making Annie Leibovitz fly oh, in the... In the, in the those in the, days, Annie wasn't... You know, Annie was ours, but not not as world famous. Okay, she thinks it had not yet bloomed out as much as they were going to, right? So, um, and he never he moved to New York because he wanted to be more famous. Money, yes, but he wanted to be. You know, in San Francisco, he was this. He and Boss Gags were, you know, the most famous, and Bill. And Bill Graham, he wanted to be more famous and more elegant than Boz Skaggs, who was pretty <laughs> elegant. And so that was the reason to go to New York. Okay. I it just was because want... of Avedon, having met Avedon and done all that stuff, then he just had to be in New York. He had to be. He was, right. He'd outgrown San Francisco. He'd, he'd, he'd grown out of that <laughs> pond. That, yeah, that pond was now. Yeah. So this is a wonderful, oh, I love this. I don't know who shot it's, this. Who shot this? Horst. Oh. Horst P. Horst. Wow. Yeah, I loved giving him work. When I had any of these doyens to do, I would give them to Horst. I had him do uh, Mrs. Uh, Astor also. They were thrilled. Are you kidding? Horst P. Horst is coming to take my picture. My lord. I mean, you worked with every. You worked with everybody, Karen. I saw. I saw a snapshot of you uh, on. I think Facebook a, a few days ago, and it, it was uh, shot by Herb Ritz. Yeah, I gave Herb some of his first work. He was he was just starting. He was just starting, and I met him when I was after uh, Rolling Stone. I they brought Look out for another run, and that's when I I met him there. And uh, that's when Ellie on the Font was my boss. He was fantastic, and John Derniak was the editor in chief. And uh, so I met Herb, and I, he was wonderful. And uh, his dad was in the acrylics or plastics business, something. And he had started out by furniture, photographing. Furniture, I think. Furniture. Furniture, something. Yeah. All I know is he gave me two little plexiglass salt and pepper shakers. And he's, um, he shot his, photographed his neighbor, who was Steve McQueen. Right? I mean, that's kind of, he was doing his neighbors. And, um, and he was wonderful. And then... Uh, I started giving him work. He did a great photo of Richard Gere because I was doing the back of the book at Look. I was not what, doing what, new. Uh, what uh, year was that? How old was he? 1979. 1979. He wasn't. He was a young guy. I mean, two years later, you'd see. I mean, he 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 was everywhere. Just like in '81, he would. He yeah. would, at that point, he was. That was like. So it was like a two-year rise to stardom for him. That's right. amazing. Well, because he was spectacularly good. Yeah. And so he did, I gave him Richard Gere to do, which he did a wonderful job. I gave him a number of people. And then um, he went to do the Bottoms family. And then I flew out to, to go to Hollywood with him. And he had Lawrence Welk's old Woody <laughs> car with the bubble decal on the back. That's and that's hilarious. how we went up to the, met the Bottoms brothers. And that's how I got in involved with the Bottoms Brothers and that's how that picture got taken and we were having such a good time. Christy Brinkley was just a, a, a peach to work with. Just She was fantastic. This is Douglas Kirkland. That's Doug. Oh, she, uh, Christy, I mean, both Douglas Kirkland and Christy Brinkley, that's like two like 
it doesn't really get any better than that. I can't imagine. No, I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think so. And I often had Doug do, uh, Douglas do the summer pleasures months, and he was just terrific. And she was she was just such a pro and so much fun to be with. And I remember saying to her, "It's just not fair that you have the legs that you do." I was laughing, and she said, "It's strictly genetics." <laughs> <laughs> such a nice thing to have said. I have nothing to do with it. It's strictly to it. But she's great. And this was another Doug Kirkland one. I can't remember this model. I think it's Kathy Ireland. Could be. I can't remember. But I always had Doug do these. He was so good at them. Yeah. He, that was... and he knew how to get the best out of these cows. They were just wonderful. Yeah. So he always did my summer pleasures. This was to show the difference. Um, this was when John Lennon was killed. And... Uh -huh. um, Annie has this wonderful picture on the left, right, which I, and she was kind enough to autograph and it's hanging on my wall. And I was not at Rolling Stone, I was at New York Magazine. So I had this old picture of John um, when he was really young. And uh, there was a great photographer that I adored named uh, Larry Williams. And he was really good and I gave him a lot of work. And he hand painted that overnight, and that's what we ran on the cover. I mean, they're both pretty good covers to they're get. Both I are, mean, aren't they? Aren't they? Yeah. If we could just get rid of that barcode. Sorry about that. <laughs> this got me banned from the White House. What? It's a yeah. White House photo. It's it's uh, Larry. I know, that, but they didn't know I got into the White House collection. <laughs> I I knew what I wanted. <laughs> and I knew I would be able to find it. And uh, and the poor person there had no idea because I was so sweet and charming. And I went, I knew what I wanted because I read about this event because Marie had written about it. And so I found the actual picture. And, you know, it's so great because she looks like, are you kidding me? Go away, Ronnie. Right? I'm with Frank. And so in running this, I got, um, this is the first time I was uh, non, not, allowed back in the picture i was not allowed to go through the pictures well myself. explain explain to us how that worked back then because it was it was a it, you had to be sweet you had to be a little um tricky mm. everything the, so the reagan white house was the first uh color negative shot everything was on color negative right. and so, there you'd have to look at contact sheets right and they were sh they were basically public record but you had to still get access to the contact sheets. Right. Right? It was a yeah. it was and a Michael oh, Evans was the shooter. Right. Oh Michael Michael shot. Was this? it Michael? Wasn't Michael? I thought Michael Larry Frank? uh uh Maybe Fitzpatrick. I, I thought Fitz I thought this was a Fitzpatrick shot, but it could be Larry. Maybe. I, I just Michael. thought I, I yeah. thought Michael was Reagan's photographer, but I could have it backwards. He was. He was, but uh Fitzgerald was working there too. Oh, I just always okay. thought it was, I thought it was his, but it's one of the best White House official yeah. photos. Yeah, I, I can't ever. swear as to whose it is because it's right. so long ago I can't remember. But I always associated the Reagan White House photo thing with Michael Evans, who was a very nice guy. Right. Very but nice. how? How? What was? What did it take to actually get to the contact sheets and? find a picture oh, and get that picture sweet. you had to say that you were doing this wonderful story on the uh on how great i never said it was being written by marie brenner either uh that we were doing a whole story about you know mrs reagan and how how elegant everything is at the white house and um that i wanted to come and try to go through uh the collection and look for pictures from various aspects of you know she's always so beautifully dressed and um, I want to be able to show that and how elegant she is, you know, usual flattery stuff, all of which was what I was looking for. And But this was the moment. The moment I saw this picture, I marked it and I marked a whole bunch of other ones so that it would just kind of slow way through. So you had to, you had to like make a bunch of selects. So now it wasn't just two or three images just so oh, you get no. the image you wanted. No, no, I yes, no, I had to camouflage it. Right. Hide, hide it. it. Hide it. Hide right. it. Bury it. And you don't have to I mean these are these are public record. I mean you have 
Yes, you have the right to these because you're paying for them. Right. They're your tax dollars at work, but actually getting a physical copy was the tricky part. Right. But I, I hung around for an extra day to make sure rather than have them send them to me. I so said that you, I was a weekly. I was on so you had to spend an extra night in the Jefferson Hotel. To, That's uh, it. I was forced <laughs> to spend another night in the Jefferson. <laughs> and then walk over and hang out with the boys over at, at the Geographic and yeah. have dinner with somebody in the Jefferson. That's rough. It's rough. It was rough. It was rough. But so it's not as rough as flying in, in, in tourist class to, to Sydney, but no, it was still no. rough. It was rough. There was no doubt about it. But someone has to do it. This is the other time I got barred from the White House uh, photo department. And uh, and I, you know, I had no way of knowing they were going to fight the wimp factor. I just went in there and got, you know, a bunch of stuff. David Valdez, I think, was the photographer. Yeah, this is David. And uh, so I, you know, I got a whole bunch of things and I knew that they were going to be talking about you know, trying to look forceful and all of that. So when I saw this, I thought, well, this works. And a whole bunch of other stuff of him and the cigarette, this is the cigarette boat and, the, you know, all, all that stuff. And I, I mean, the it. funny part is that he was and kind of an athletic guy. On it. Right. And then I got a phone call saying, you can't come down here anymore. And I said, I don't write the headlines. <laughs> I just pick the pictures. You want to get mad at somebody? Get mad at the person who wrote the headline. When, when did you see the headline, Karen? I want to oh, know. Oh, of course, when they're mocking up the cover. Okay, so like Friday cover. night, Friday night. Oh, Friday night, whenever, yes. Thursday afternoon. I, I just want to know because... No, what, Friday what did night you... they would mock up the cover. Ro- and, okay. And I, I saw what Patricia had been given for the headline, Patricia Bradbury, and I saw that. And I was like, oh, well, I can kiss off going down to the White House for a while. And, uh, and I said that, I said, you know, I'm going to get banned by your, I told that to Rick Smith. I said, I'll be banned for a while. And so will you. I said, so will your guys. And they have it on the front line, you know, they, you know let's see what Feynman has to say about that. So what you, what you, I want to know what you did to protect your, your staff and your contract photographers who had to deal directly with the president and his administration well, I always, on the campaign trail. Well, it was simple. Um, they, you know, if anybody was giving them a hard time, I mean, nobody really. I, I mean, want I mean, specifics, Karen, because you assigned some young photographer to the to the to the Bush campaign, the Monday after this, the, when this cover appeared. Which, was it you? Yes, it was. I assigned you. Oh my God, I assigned you. It was the day after, and they didn't want anything to do with you, right? Did you even get on the plane? No, I, li- I well, I, I was sitting next to PF, and I didn't want PF to know I was working for Newsweek. Uh huh. So I just, I didn't tell anybody I was working for Newsweek, including PF, and I just told him I was here for contact. And there was, I don't think we had any flights that week, so it wasn't, it was just a bus ride, and so getting on the bus, I didn't have to, you know, Identify it wasn't yourself. an official manifest right for a bus. And so I was the contact press photographer uh, on the campaign that week. And they all assumed that there was no Newsweek photographer. I didn't know what was coming. I just did this out of instinct. I didn't know what the cover was. But I just didn't want PF to know who I was. Right, right. And so, you know, we're sitting next to you. We're, you know, hand in hand all day long. But I just, I don't want him to know my film's going to Newsweek. Right. And uh, so at the end of the week, like probably Friday afternoon, I told, I think it was Bruce Zanka was a, I, maybe I'm, Bruce Zanka was the, uh, the the photographer wrangler in PF. And I told them both at the same time I was there for Newsweek. And they all got a laugh out of it because, you know, the week was over. So. Right. No, I just got pushed back about, you know, you can't come into the picture collection. And that, did, you know, it lasted a month or so and then it was over. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was just the immediate thing. But I, I mean, George, George, Will, George Will had done the lap dog essay like a couple months before this. So right. this, was, this was actually gave them a, a way to address this. It, you did them a favor, really, from a yeah. campaign, campaigning point of view, right? I mean, well, I guess. But at the time, they were not, they didn't see it as a favor. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. 
So this is when the shuttle uh, broke, blew up. Right. And um, I didn't have a photographer down there. Is this the Sigma image? Or? Well, it became the Sigma image. Because oh, I, you uh, found it and then Sigma got it? How'd that work? I, oh, this is how it worked. This picture, <laughs> you know the guys from Nikon that are always down at all the liftoffs and they have all the long lenses and the... Sure. And well, they, after they've blown out all the equipment, they go and record, uh, they shoot it. Right. Okay. So uh, Kevin McVeigh worked for me then uh, at Newsweek. He was my traffic person, brilliant mm. young kid, smarter than the web. How, how old was Kevin at that point? He must have been like 12. <laughs> Close. He was, he was in his 20s. Right. Okay. And, um, and I used to give him a real hard time. But I adored him, and he adored me back. And you know, I had a sliding glass, uh, like a drive-up window that was in my office, and I would flip it open, and everybody that worked for me was straight on down. And I would, if I wanted something, I would just yell out, "Kevin!" <laughs> and he used to tell me later that the hair on the back of his neck would just stand up. When I I'm did. sure it probably wakes him up in the middle of the night. Oh, and then when day. Ralph Alswang came there, and I would yell, "Ralph!" Kevin was just so delighted to sit there and smile because he, <laughs> he was no longer the low man on the pole. <laughs> but anyway, so Kevin came up with a, this blows up and we all just, everybody just, right? That was a, that yeah. was a huge deal. It was huge. Yeah. And I knew that Ralph Morse would be down there for time. I knew that, right? And he, he had that place wired. But Kevin had the idea to call down to Nikon, to Pekala's people down there. And he got them on the phone. And they had the film, they'd shot this. And I bought it sight unseen. So you locked it up and tell me- Locked to, it just, up. How, how yeah. did you lock it up? Tell me exactly how you locked it up. Oh, this is such a long time ago. I, how I, much I, money did it take? How much promising did it take? And then did well, you call Well, first of all, Elian I was on the phone and they, well, I'll tell you how El, Elian got it from me. <laughs> So I locked it up. Scotty really liked me. And, you know, I, I was easy to get along with. I was, this, you know, and I would always take them out. And we'd, we'd drink a lot. We had a lot of fun, right? And I just, I had a different vibe than Arnold, who has, is a lovely guy, but it, just a different thing. You know, I was the only woman doing it. So that had, had a lot of pluses to it, okay? And, I, you know, I was... In a great look, I was a great looking dame in those days. Not that I'm bad now, but I was really sharp and I was always well dressed. And so I got on the phone, Kevin thought of it, got him on the phone. Dang, Scott, Scott Andrews, I think his last name was. Terrible memory for names. But anyway, I made a deal right there on the spot. And he said, Well, you can run it by Pekela. I had Pekela on the phone, Bill Pekela. I made a deal. And they both said, well, You know, Arnold can't find out that we you got it from us right so i said no problem don't worry about it I, it's my film i tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to get i'm going to call ellie on lafont and she's going to be your agent you're going to make a lot of money scotty you're going to make a lot of money and she'll take care of everything and don't worry so i call her up on the phone we we're best friends really best friends and i say to her i say to her uh don't forget i'd i'd work for her in 79 right it, look and we were tight as dicks <laughs> i called her up and i said i have an opportunity for you it's gonna be fantastic i have the pictures that the nikon guys shot of this thing blowing up it's extraordinary now how this is going to work is this they can't afford to have played favorites so now you're going to be the agent you're going to make them a scat amount of money. When Arnold calls them, they'll tell them to call you. And you will say, I've already called you for that. And I've already tied it up. And the best part of this is I get it for cheap. Because you're going to make money from everywhere around the world. What do you think about that deal? She said, oh, Cherie, that's a great deal. I mean, oh, this, uh, and that's so how the business was done. And, and, Arnold how, called, and Arnold called Scotty, but he was late. 
And right. Scotty said, well, I have an, it's Ellie on the phone. It's the agent. Man, he's on the phone to Ellie. Oh, Cherie, you're late. <laughs> Madame Malarkey just called. She's tied everything up. Oh, I'm so sorry, Arnold. I'm so sorry. Oh, do, you, do, you, do you recall about how much money we're talking about? No, I really don't. I mean, God, this is so long ago. I mean, it was a number of thousands of dollars, but it was not, it was, it did not break my bank. Okay. So it, it wasn't was, it wasn't that much really then for that first for, for that me, first. no but it but didn't for matter sigma for sigma they and for the photographer fortune. they made was, a fortune it's it's like this is your this is you can buy a house now or you can you send can, oh, kids please. to college just think of all the places around right. the world this picture ran right you know come on it was phenomenal and i just ran their name with sigma after it right, right. <laughs> He still, I think I, he, I still heard, used to, when I had my old Facebook page, I always heard from him. I had his son call me once, just to keep the family, keep it in the family. But I was thrilled to do it. But that, I, when I went downstairs and they said, oh my God, you did such a great job. My answer was always the same way. I, I said, that was Kevin McVeigh. He thought of that. But did, was Kevin, was Kevin down there? No, he was in the office, outside my office. Oh, he did you? There. So did he you? Did you? There. I had nobody. Okay, you had nobody, and so did you? Did you uh, have somebody actually? Did you get him a plane ticket and fly that film, or what? Uh, did you I, do? I don't think it. I don't. I don't believe. I left that to Kevin. He forgot. I think this was like a Tuesday, though, so you had plenty. Of, we had plenty of time, right? And I don't think that. I mean, however it got up here, that was Kevin's responsibility, right? Right. I never did that stuff. I mean, I, that wasn't what I. He could get anything from anywhere. No, I know. I worked. I mean, he went to time after you left. Yeah, Newsweek. that's why Michelle hired him after this. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Came, they came a calling. And when he came in to tell me he was leaving to go work at time, he was so terrified. And I, he told me, and I said, I want you to leave my office now before I say something I'll regret. No, I'll I thought you left. I thought you left. Uh, no, he left before. Then I got David Berkowitz. Okay. Well, you, you you made out okay then. Oh, I made out great. No, <laughs> I did. Berkowitz was real nervous about taking it. And uh, John, John Whalen took him aside and said, kid, don't be stupid. <laughs> yeah. She, she looks scary. She's really not that scary. Just do it. So the interesting thing about this story, you know, you, uh, you paved this road before you, at any of this years before you were always, taking people to dinner, buying drinks, yeah. Oh, yeah. being nice, being fun, being well-dressed. This, this road was paved years before, and you didn't oh, know what, how it was going to pay off, but that was just part no. of your job. But, but you have to understand, at life, I learned that. I learned that, you know, I, and not only that, I enjoyed doing it. It wasn't like I was doing it and I, because I needed to get some. I, I did it because I had a lot of fun. I used to go out with the photographers all the time. I loved being around them. They were so interesting. They had such diverse interests other than just the camera. And so I was fascinated by them. And I, I would always have dinner with them. I, mean, I, I went out with Epridge all the time. All these guys, I just, you know, Carl Mines would take me to dinner. I would just be enthralled, right? Gordon Parks. So I learned early that there was, there was much to be mined here, much to be learned, much to a lot of fun to be had. These were fascinating people. And so even, you know, when the war correspondents would come, I, this was for me a natural way to do business. I never even considered doing it any other way. And I mean, that's how I got Mark Peters. I mean, he was signing the time contract with Noctway standing next to him and Peter McCabe. And I ring on the phone and I say to him, I want you to sign sign a contract with Newsweek. And he goes, well, I'm about to do this. I said to him, oh, honey, don't be ridiculous. I'm so much more fun than any of those people at time. And I'm going to give you all of Africa. What more could you want? <laughs> and he said, I can't think of a thing. And then he looked at Nakwe and said, I'm going to sign the contract with Newsweek. And Nakwe went crazy. How can you do that? He said, no, I, I, she sounds great, Karen. You know, her, 
And Dr. goes, yeah, I do know her. Yes, she is great. You're great. Uh, I get it. But I know this is the way it worked. Yeah. So this is, a, this is the Turnleys. This is Peter. This is Tiananmen. And, um, and Berkowitz was there. I had sent Berkowitz over with the equipment. I snuck in the Cytex machine into, into China. We had that. That's how we got all of our pictures out. Time had to ship it to Hong Kong and then back. We didn't have to ship anything. I, we just had to process it. And the guys could process it. And I snuck the chemistry in when they needed it. I sent someone through Canton. And so then, just, to, just, to, just to, so people understand, photographers were still shooting film. Oh, yes. I'm they, sorry. I'm right. ahead of myself. And so they, this is C41. And they could, you could process that process that in your hotel room you could process it at the ap bureau wherever you could even go to a one-hour photo and process it in some places right um but Not uh Beijing, but you could in other places right <laughs> um but then you then you would have this uh cytex scanner that would scan the film and send it over a regular phone line that's correct and what I, was interesting is that i never asked permission it was, it was against the State Department rules to take that Cytex machine in. But I took it in anyway, because we were there because uh, I guess it was Gorbachev was going there to visit China. I think that's how this all started. And then, uh, and then from that, the, the, uh, one of the Chinese leaders was moved back and he was the favorite of the students and you know all of that is a bit of a fog now but that's how all of this started and we had the cytex machine and i had gotten it in there because elian lafont once again my good dear friend was representing the xinhua agency sort of the ap of china and uh the pravda of china yeah. and so i had them invite me to bring this in and we were going to show them how it worked. Now, I did not ask for permission to do that. I just did it. And so the one thing the Chinese did not do during Tiananmen was uh, turn off the phone system. Right. So the, out of their telephone system, then that's how we got all the pictures out. Well, it was it was the the law of unintended consequences. They, yes. they had AT&T, uh, I think it was AT&T, it could have been a, a European company, build all their phone lines um, for their military in the country. Uh -huh. And the, 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 if it was AT&T, they said, well, we're doing this for the military. We're going to have that network in place. You might as well put these phone lines into the hotels and everything else. And they said, yeah, sure. So they couldn't shut off the phones to the hotels without shutting off oh, the phones to their military. Oh, I did not know this. Yeah. Oh no! I just learned something wonderful. And there were there were digital there were digital lines. You know, I could I could call New York and and have you know crystal clear, which was which was kind of crazy at that time. It was not common to All right. call halfway around the world from a communist country and have crystal clear phone lines and all you know the. CNN could use those same phone lines. Everybody could use. Them. Every did, and that was the reason the story got out. Right. So this was the um, this was the day. At, this was after the the trouble, the the march by the army. And this is Peter as well. I think it is Peter. I don't remember. That's an honest answer. Okay. Uh, this was a story on AIDS, and um, this was based on a story I worked on as a kid at Life, which was documenting um, one week's dead in in Vietnam. And um, so this was uh, an idea they came up with at Newsweek, and um, and they did not know at that time that I had worked on the uh, the Life magazine piece on um, those who died in one week in Vietnam, and uh, and had helped gather the pictures as a kid. You know, I mean, that was my job. So when they came to me with this idea, I told them I I worked on the Life one, so that seemed a certain amount of symmetry. Yeah, the life, uh, that was a, one of the one week of dead in Vietnam with a, a mugshot of every soldier that was killed. Um, and they had to call their parents. Yeah. 
that was a rough one. It was. I worked on that with Bobby Baker. I know you oh. did. I know you did. That was a, that was it's a, people still reference it today. And you know, today they, they, they reference it, they rip it off without even knowing the source material. Yeah. This is the wonderful and ever so fabulous Florence Joyner. Flo Jo was just the best. He's and every Mark, photographer. Mark Hanauer yeah. shot this for me. Uh, who shot? Who, sorry, Mark who shot? Hanauer. Mark Hanauer out of Los Angeles, a, a movie star photographer. Right. And uh, I asked her <laughs> where all that strength came from. You know, the reason she had one leg always covered is because she had a nasty scar. Yeah. And uh, but the, I said to her, where did that, Florence? Because when she came out of the block, she was laughing. Nothing more intimidating. First of all, she was as fast as the wind. But when she, those nails and the whole thing always done up. And when she would come out of the blocks, I, I never saw anybody like this. She'd come out of the blocks laughing and just blow down the field. So I asked her, I said, where do you get, where does that power come from? And she reached over and just grabbed her butt back here. She said, right out of here, honey. <laughs> no, she was, she was, she was a photographer's dream. I mean, you couldn't, you, I mean, I, you couldn't I, make a bad picture. No, uh, it was, it was, uh, today did you, photograph her? did you photograph her? I, uh, I did the 88, uh, Seoul Olympics and that's kind of where she, uh, that was when she really kind of got into full flow Joe mode. Absolutely. Absolutely. She had the hair, she had the nails, she had the makeup, oh. and she knew how to work the camera. It was oh. just like, you know, forget about it. Look at this. I mean, really, she knew just what to do. Yeah. Always. Yeah. You she's know, standing we, on a stool, on a box. That's where she's on with a towel over it. Right. She, I, I have this, this concept, this idea that, uh, you know, you don't have to go, you don't have to know have a program to know who the stars are because your your camera is attracted to them when you're shooting sports so you don't That's you don't true. have to know who the players are you can go in you know the russian gymnastics team you don't need to know each of them you right. know which one and this is you know michael jordan flo jo these right. it's it's speaking, speaking of michael of, jordan yeah this was the uh, sportsman of the year obviously it's a hologram and um, it was so much fun to do this with him. It was just wonderful. And um, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. It was a real challenge. I had him on a turntable. This woman uh, who shot it uh, was a surfer, windsurfer up in the, uh, up in Oregon in that area where the wind is so outrageous up there on the gap or something it's called. Yeah. The Columbia gap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when she was either doing that or making holograms, those were the two things she did. <laughs> and I found her and she did it with a series of cameras, right? Uh, just incredible technical stuff. And so I had him on a um, turntable with a plumb bob, that was out of camera, but had to stay right in the center of his head. And when I explained that to him, he was like on it. And I said, so here's how this is going to work. We're going to turn the table. So at nine o'clock on the clock, I want you deadly serious. And by the time the, the turntable gets to six, I want that Michael Jordan smile. And by the turntable gets you over to three o'clock, I want you deadly serious. And that's how it was. So if you move it, he goes from being totally serious to the big smile to the whole thing. He loved doing it. And he, uh, you know, and I said to him, you know, because we, we, I had gotten to know him pretty well by then. And I said to him, you know, I ought to give you, since you're on the road so much, I, we should make a little one of that. And it could be in the house and it could say to your kids, have you done your homework? <laughs> and he was like, Karen, that's cruel. <laughs> that's not nice. <laughs> That's not nice. No, he is a wonderful person. I adored him. I what, love uh, him. What, what kind of a, so when people don't probably realize that when you have somebody like Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson on your set, you might have five minutes. You might have three minutes. You might have 10 minutes. If 10 minutes, no, no. you're lucky, right? I, um, I never had that problem with Michael. However no, long I needed him, 
he was there. And I was always very clear that it would take X number of time because we never did simple shoots. And so how much time did this shoot take is what I want to ask. Half a day. Half a day. Easy. Which, which in like Michael Jordan time, that's like what, half a million dollars of his time? <laughs> Easy. Easy. But yeah. he, he, was, he, he liked doing, he li we got along and I never had him do anything that wasn't unusual. <laughs> So he was always intrigued by that. He always knew that something unusual would be, would be part of, would be the design. And therefore he was always intrigued with what we might've come up with. So that's, that's, a, that's another great point. It's like the investment you make with just uh, being a good person. When you have somebody on set, you don't waste their time and you always, you have to deliver, right? You don't deliver once and it's over. And I was always very specific about what time he would show up and we would start five hours before he would show up. Right. So by the time he would arrive, we were ready to roll. And what and happens, what happens if this photographer, if she, if she doesn't, if the plumb bob moves and she can't uh, line up the 12 frames? Well, he, he never, he, he, no, it worked because there was no problem that the plumb bob was going to, it was whether or not he would move. Right. I'm just, I'm just saying you can't you can't screw up you can't screw up if you no and michael understood that if he didn't stay conscious so after each rotation we would go back to the middle and once again sight him up almost with like a red dot but you know what i mean line him right. up so he was always right there he wanted to know exactly was he in the right place he would look up he got me you know this is a person who understands spatial arrangement really right. well <laughs> Oh, this was, you know, for him, this was just, uh, this was, this was fun. And you're shooting on film at this point? I don't Yeah, this is shot all on film. So you've got no, uh, you've got no tethered monitor happening. You, you, you really. Uh, I don't remember one she might have. I don't remember it. I was too busy just keeping my eye on him and when he would smile and when he was to shut it off. That was right. my job. Nice. And I would say to him, bring the smile now. Now, not full, now full, big, right, big, right. Big, then back up. That's what I did the whole time. She ran her business. I had no business over there because it was far too complicated for me. And right. I, no point in her being there. Right. I mean, my being over there to clog it up. She knew just what she needed. And she was really confident. Nice. Right. Oh, oh. this. <laughs> here we are. So this is, I, I often show this to the students so they can see what I look like at each of these events. And so this is me during the Life Magazine days on the, on the left in our mini skirts and on the right with Bobby Baker doing some skit. We often did skits. We were, we were crazy. We got away with murder, Barbara and I. The Mutt and Jeff of Life Magazine. You guys did. You guys continued to get away with murder from. Yes, we did. Yeah, we tried really hard to never let go of that. So these are just some of the. So this is the lift off going to the moon. And is this a Ralph or is this a NASA camera? Well, this is the this is the remote camera that Ralph taught them how to install. So this is a NASA cam. But Al Schneider, who was the the equipment guru at life they invent he and the guy from the geographic invented the nitrogen invented, they had to invent this stuff it didn't yeah. exist i mean it didn't exist so the the two geniuses one it's because uh, we were part of a consortium national geographic and life right. and um, and so and uh in the wire so anyway they invented the nitrogen purge box so that this thing could go up and not burn up the camera I mean, that was the trick. You had to shoot the pictures, and then you had to keep the camera from being melted. Right. And as the guys were going in, they would click, they would start the camera rolling. Right. So, and so this would, this would just be shooting frames continuously until this moment. Yeah. For whatever, 10 minutes or whatever. Whatever. 10 minutes of film running through there. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so when you say consortium, I mean, Life Magazine bought the rights to the astronaut story, but there was still, um, it was kind of a pool situation between Life and National Geographic. Is that correct? 
That is correct. And I think the Associated Press was part of it. AP, okay. Yeah, and then there was a, um, I, I want to say some sort of a book publisher, but I, I can't swear to that. It's, yeah, that makes don't sense. Don't ask me to go right. back to 1969. I'm lucky to remember yesterday. Sorry. I can't go back <laughs> that far. This was the actual liftoff. And um, in a really nice shot. And um, is this a magazine I, spread? What? Do, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was. Um, yeah, this is from life, and I'm somewhere in this mask because this is where I was. Right, that's just. That's came. just in a. It's. It, it's a. It's. It's a beautiful spread to start with, but the the historical idea that somebody was smart enough to shoot it wide <laughs> and then yeah, pan over to the right, you know? Yeah, it's perfect. I mean, it's two frames. It's just, you know. It's well done. Yep. Works. This is a Larry picture. Is this, just, the, uh, is this from the same day he made that... Uh, the famous one of yeah. the black, yes. Yeah. Same place. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. It's... 25 cents. How about that? <laughs> this whole series. Is that uh, Catherine? Uh, no, this is taken by Larry. I mean, in oh, the background. Is that Catherine Leroy? I believe it is. I think it is. She's a tiny I believe little it thing. Is. Yeah. Yeah. She was a tough nut. Woo. She had to be. She's one of the few women out there, and they didn't give her any breaks. I promise you that. It's a hell of a shot, huh? Oh, this, this is, is the shot. picture. Yeah. It's an amazing picture. It's an extraordinary picture. It's from the same hill as the cover. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you tried to, if you, we could talk about this picture for an hour, if we went through and dissect, I mean, just, the, just there's the one spot of color in the image alone, and then yes, the 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 the, the, the whole hill is chewed to shit and back, nothing standing, and these guys, these Marines, have been in this horrific battle for this hill, which no doubt they let they finally won, then left, and of course, twenty minutes later, the VC had it. Yeah. I mean, that muck. Yeah, I mean, I, we could, we could uh, dissect this picture. We could write a paper on this picture. It's uh, yes. so extraordinary. Yeah. This is John Olson from Quay. This is a well-known picture, too. And right. it's, it's rare for Vietnam because we didn't have the, the tracked vehicles too often. No, and not only that, um, he shot this one. He's with Stars and Stripes and snuck this film to the Life um, Bureau. And he shouldn't have because he was part of the service. Right. And so we ran it um, with using his middle name. The credit read John Stewart and not John Stewart Olson. Right. And then I didn't later, know that. Oh, yeah. It, the credit ran John Stewart. And then months later, I'm sitting at outside Pollard's office because Anne was away or something, and I'm now playing for her first secretary. And this young man comes up, looks, doesn't even look like he shaves, and um, says to me that his name was John Olson, and he was sent to see Mr. Pollard. Yeah. I said, really, that's nice. And who sent you? And he said, a man by the name of Dick. I said, Dick, really? Did he have a last name? And he was just, you know as green as he could be and so nervous. And I finally go, what floor was he on? Can you remember what floor you were on? So he tells me, I said, oh, would it have been Mr. Clermont? Dick, yes. So I called down to Clermont's office and he go, yeah, that's the guy who took the picture from play. And I said, and your name again? He goes, John Olson. I said, do you have a middle name? He goes, yes, John Stewart Olson. I said, stay right there. And <laughs> but we can't try to guess what this guy would look like, right? And we all thought some grizzled, whatever. And so I go into Pollard's, I said, don't move, okay? And I go into Mr. Pollard's office and I said, what do you think John Stewart looks like? And he goes, why? I said, well, his real name is John Stewart Olson and he's outside. What do you think he looks like? And he goes, why? What are you going to tell me? I said, I'll tell you that the kid outside doesn't look like he shaves yet. <laughs> I'll go, that's what I think. You should see. So he goes in and he tells uh, 
he tells, he's like 18. And uh, so he tells uh, Pollard that he wants to be a life staff photographer. That's his goal in life. And Pollard says to him, did you finish high school? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, have you been to college? And he goes, no. He goes, I think you should go to college and then come back and see. And he wouldn't give in. He wouldn't do it. So that's how he became the youngest staff photographer, ousting Epridge from that title. That's a great story. I didn't know that. Yeah. I did not know that. And we got to be best, best friends. So there's the one week dead. So this is this what we were talking, One Week's mm -hmm. Dead. It was in Life magazine. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, some people credit it for um, turning the tide a bit as far as public opinion about the Vietnam War. Right. So this is the um, Joseph Lowe series. So tell us, tell us how Joseph Lowe's pictures ended up in Life magazine. Um, Joe Lowe was a, a young man from South Africa, as I remember, and he was traveling uh, with Dr. King, and he was part of, uh, he was working at um, National Public Radio or Public Broadcasting. He was connected there, and he was like a young intern person, This is as I remember it. And he was there for, on, on this experience, and Dr. King was, of course, his idol. And he was out there, and he shot the first picture, and then he shot the shot of Dr. King following the bullet that was fired from across the way. And, um, and he was devastated, which is, to put it mildly. And uh, he called to his boss at the public radio, public broadcasting, who called Phil Coonhart because they were good friends, and Coonhart was the assistant managing editor of Live, and told him about this film, and Coonhart bought it on the spot. Don't ask me how much, I have no idea. And uh, I was dispatched to the airport, Newark Airport, to meet a plane coming in from Memphis uh, at like two in the morning, and to find this kid. And, uh, and I did. I walked around with a rolled up Life magazine and found him. And he was shell shocked to say the least. And I got, and I was told to, when I got back to, and I had a cab even waiting for me where I was going to pay, pay the guy extra. Because in those days, you could take a cab from New York to Newark Airport in New Jersey, but you had to take the New Jersey cab back to the city. And I was not going to be looking for a cab at two in the morning with this young guy. So I promised the cab driver, I don't know, like 50 bucks or something, which was a huge amount of money, if he would just wait, run the meter. So anyway, I get him in the cab, and I want to know where the film is, because I'd been instructed to not walk in the building unless I had the film on my person. And, you know, I'm trying to... You know, I'm a kid and I want to do right and I want to impress them and I'm a, you know, they're watching me and I'm watching them and trying to get everything. And so I keep asking him, where is the film? At the same time, I'm telling him how dreadful and it was dreadful. And I could see he was just in terrible shape. <clears throat> so I'm kind of rubbing his back and trying to find out. And, I, and everyone's, every few minutes I'd say, and where's the film? And he'd say, well, I processed it. He did, he processed it. Yeah, I was afraid, you know. If I didn't process it, I might lose the, the role or they might stop me or something. So in any case, it turned out he had taken the black and white and he had, <laughs> he'd processed it. And then he'd taken a manila envelope and cut it into strips. And then each strip of the film, he put in one of those slips of the manila envelope, which he then taped to his chest and then put his shirt over. And so when he begins to tell me this, I start to unbutton his shirt, you know, I do, poor thing, oh my God, oh my God. And now I'm thinking, how am I going to get this off his chest? Because Coonhart, I better have the film. And the driver thinks I'm about to give him a blowjob or something and just berserk, starts screaming, not in my cab. And I'm saying, I, I'm not going to do anything here. I'm just helping this guy. Just relax. You're getting your $50. Shut up and drive, basically. And then I just keep pulling these things off his chest, which he fortunately had no chest hair. 
And uh, by the time we got to the Time Life Building, I had all of it. And then I, <coughs> I took him to Mr. Coonhart and stood behind him and said, just did thumbs up to Phil. And then I went down to the lab and turned the, it in and they made contact sheets. And that's how I got that stuff. And so how, how old was he? He was like 18 or 19, I think. Oh, I guess. I don't know that answer. I'm sorry. He was a young guy. But he was, he was about, you were about the same, were you a couple years older than I him? I was older. I was older than he was. I, I, I mean, he's, I'm going to say I'm in my mid twenties. He could have been also, or a little younger. I don't, I don't remember. That's a more honest answer. I just don't remember. But this kind of set a tone that I think followed you, or maybe it just, maybe it just was a, a pattern that you follow. I mean, you had to, uh, you had to uh, walk photographers through some rough times, but at I the did. same point, you had to like actually get the material. You had to from be, them. you had to get the material. You had to be, you had to be sympathetic and tough at the same time. It's a, it, you know, I, I remember much about this experience because it was so searing what I was having to do. And uh, it was something I had never had to do before. And it, um, it toughened me up in a way. I mean, it was it was almost to me to my rec to my way of thinking. It was almost one of those watershed moments for you as a photo editor, I a future it, photo editor. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, it was. And um, I mean, there's a lot to the story. And you know that he didn't take he wouldn't take the picture until they covered up Dr. King's head. And Bobby told me, um, and Efforts told me that's because he was an amateur and not a pro. And this happened in April of 68. And I remember saying to Evers, do you mean to tell me if someone shot Bobby Kennedy in front of you, you would lean over and try to help him and do all that? And he would say to me, said to me, no, my job is to take the picture, not to edit the film in the camera, but to take the picture and turn in the film. And then the next person up, who's the editor, they get to edit it. I don't get to do that. My job is to take the picture. And that was kind of prophetic. Is that was very, yes. And then, so this is taken on the flight from Oregon to California after losing the Oregon election. Oregon and you should, I mean, we should just point out that, that uh, not only was, I mean, Bill was the Life Magazine photographer on this campaign, which gave a person a certain, uh, amount of clout as a photographer a certain amount but of freedom. Stanley Treddick, Stanley Treddick was looks photographer and, and Bobby liked Stanley you know also very much and they had a lot of access okay um, so, so it was um, what I'm getting at though it's there is um, it's not so the goal of every political photographer I think is to get behind the blue curtain if you've ever been to mm -hmm. any White House or political event, there's always a blue curtain, and the good pictures happen on the other side of that blue curtain. Mm -hmm. And we have this thing where we kind of like do this, this uh, wink and nod type of all access thing in political photography today. Mm -hmm. But this was, this was a different era when if you had access, you actually had access, you can think of David Douglas Duncan shooting the 72 campaign. You can think of Bill Epperidge on this campaign. When, when a photographer, they weren't there to be, I mean, what Bill is saying, I'm, I can be friends with this guy, but when I'm working, we're not friends. I'm here to make pictures. That's right. That's right. And it doesn't have, you know, it, you know, we're not cozying up. We're not like, you know, being pals. We're there to work. To work. Yeah. I mean, he may adore him. And then, of course, this happens. And he, he just took the picture. I, you know, he, uh, he, uh, he said that's what he 
was there to do and that's what he did and, and that's what he did and he paid a price for it you never come out of these things completely unscathed you know no we know that but yeah. uh do I we know that, that. Do, we, do we know that before we before we uh work so hard to get to to get in that position where we make those pictures i mean do we know it do we know what the deal is before we uh do we, we sign the, the contract before we actually know what we're signing i think that's right that's right this picture still makes me very sad that year was the worst year 78 the only good thing that happened in 1978 news was, was that they went around the moon at christmas time right mike borman's group they went around the moon and that was it that was the only good news there was in 1968 yeah I never went to bed in 68. Oh. It was a rough year for you as, as and you know, you're not actually have kid. to be in the room, you know. Right. I'm a kid. So this is me at Rolling Stone after, after life, I got to be in my hippie side. My hippie side took a bloom and I, I stopped being, you know, I got into rock and roll. Well, you, you'd learned, you learned to surf before you went to Rolling Stone. That should probably be, we should probably yes. make that clear. Yes, you, that's true. You were, in, you were down in... Uh, I was down in, in uh, I was down in uh, uh, La Jolla. And La Jolla. I, and, and I lived in La Jolla. I worked in Del Mar at Psychology Today, and we would surf every day for lunch. Get a little can of tuna and an avocado, and that was lunch, and we'd that's surf. That's probably that's probably pretty good therapy for coming off a, 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 a few years at life magazine. I would think it was, it was really good therapy. And, and I just, you know, I just, I just discovered that other side of myself that wasn't, you know, I unbuttoned some things. That's all. I, I mean, you were pretty businesslike up until uh, this rolling. St I mean, weren't yeah. you, you? You were serious. You went to, I was a, to business and then school. When I went to psychology, when I went to psychology today, I, then I began to loosen up a bit. Right. Not as much as Linda right here, who's doing a lot of cocaine on that mirror, which was such a wonderful shot. What, what? She called it the $250,000 a day diet. <laughs> $250,000 a year diet. <laughs> Where, where, where's the where's the where's the public relations person oh i know where was the <laughs> pr person i don't know i guess they missed it but we probably gave them the wrong date linda didn't want anybody around she was just happy to have annie you know it's it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of funny i mean not only did the politicians not know any better than give photographers free reign but the the musicians didn't, didn't either care. well they didn't care that's the thing to remember. They didn't care. I mean, it was rock and roll. It was, you know, it just, it was a different game. A totally different game. That's all. I mean, I don't know who the, I don't know who the equivalent of uh, Linda Ronstadt is today, but. Uh, I have no idea, but that wouldn't have this picture. <laughs> we wouldn't have this picture, would we? No, we would not. And if, and the, and the, the picture that, you know, this is, the same day the cover was made. Um, yes, it is. It's all that same day. Right. We wouldn't. We would have had to probably get the okay from the designer uh, that make sure that this was the right brand for the the celebrity. We'd have to have a makeup artist. We'd have to have a hair. Oh no. Well, we. I think we may have had a makeup. She might have had a makeup person. I can't remember. They probably did, but they didn't give a shit. I mean, in those days, nobody cared. <clears throat> we were doing cocaine. I mean, we were so. That period, you thought you could do cocaine in front of a cop and it would be just fine. <laughs> it was just, you know, another, it was a very different century. A very different decade. Well, I mean, it, it kind of, it kind of, uh, where we started this conversation is trying to figure out, you know, the difference between a bunch of good pictures or a bunch of pictures that are fine. Isn't this like a picture you, said, you want to spend some time with? Absolutely. Um, not only, I mean, I was probably like 13 when this image was taken. So yeah, absolutely. But and, um, and the color of her nail polish, by the way, which you can't see in this picture, but she went and got a red nail polish that would match 
I see the nail polish on the table next to the Yeah, coat. and it matches her, her the teddy. Right. And we have a little drink here with a cherry in it. <laughs> Why not? It, Why we're, not? We're going with that red theme. We want we want red oh, nail red polish. Theme. We're red. doing it. <laughs> um, I guess alcohol I guess, beverage. Right. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is there's there's some things you can't fake regardless of anything else and the more image conscious we get, the more our images suffer, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Now she had enough smarts to put on black hosiery. Yeah. So she was smart. She knew yeah. how to make her legs look great. I always, I always, I always, that always made me wonder about this image, you know? Um, I'm not sure what she's doing. It's a, she was what, a complete companion on this game. Right, right. She saw it, she heard the idea, she was all over it, bang, done. Of course there right. was makeup and hair there because you could tell from the cover. Right. But I there mean, wasn't there wasn't 15 other people and, and there weren't no, any contracts there would be a to hair, sign. There would be makeup, Annie probably had an assistant with her because lighting was not her strong suit. Right. She didn't need that. And right. she just, you know, it was a small crew, right. I promise you. This was an extremely small crew. This was just Annie. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Now, once again, Annie where's the team. where's, where's the corporate? Keith, you know, where's the... Where's, oh my God! The guys from the Rolling Stones were so upset. This was in Toronto, you know, when he got popped for he and the oh, what was that awful woman he was with? Um, oh. Yeah, what was her name? Popeye. She had Popeye arms, which was coming from shooting up so much. It'll come to me tomorrow. Anyway, <coughs> and he and Annie had set up, she's going to do a shoot, and she said to me, well, I'm going to do it in the hotel room. What do I do? I said, hang hey, sheets. I just get sheets do that. So she was all set. Everything was all set. He just said, oh, I just have to go to the bathroom for a minute. <laughs> and he came out, and he shot up, and bang. Down like a stone. So she took the picture. I thought that was fantastic. I don't know that they ran it, which was a shame, but I can't remember. But it was classic, classic Keith Richards. I'll be right back. I just have to go to the John. Okay. Uh, it's 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 you know it's it's it's, it's, it's an image that. Uh, That's an image. Defines that it defines that. I mean, you can see the the, the room t the room uh, room service tray there. I don't know what's on that tray, but I, a large bottle of something. Yeah, um, it defines an era. It defines a, a person. It defines a, a a band. It's it's it's. It's amazing. It is amazing. It's perfect. And that's, I mean, that's the story. I mean, you, if this was on film, it would have passed by. You could never get back to this picture. This picture, when you ask me, what, are, what makes great pictures? Hello, this is a picture you spent some time with. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone we've looked at our pictures pretty much you want to spend some time with. Do you think, I mean, was Annie traveling with these lights? No, we did... sent her up there. We sent her up there with them. Oh, so she, she wasn't her... traveling with them. Oh, no, no. Point. We sent her to Toronto. And did she have a, a lighting assistant? Oh, you're asking me a question. I don't know. Annie I'm just saying know. because the lights don't look right to me. Well, then and I, I was think Annie kind of did them herself. She did it herself. Yeah, yeah I don't think we had an assistant. <laughs> I don't think there was an assistant on this. I think she just did her best to just flash it up on the... No, exactly. She's just like trying to get some light there so you can some see. Some light, it. please. And there's something, yeah. probably a lamp over on the floor on the other side. Exactly. Oh, it's so good. It's so, so good. good. So perfect. <laughs> and not uncommon. Perfect. And not uncommon. <laughs> and this is just another, another Keith moment of an, a quick nap. <laughs> The frightening thing, the frightening thing after this nap, he was probably doing pretty good. Oh, no, he would be fine. I mean, yeah. it was just scary that yeah. he could be so screwed up and then still go on stage was just quite extraordinary. This is a great picture. It is. It's an amazing photo. And, you know, today, there's not, I don't think there's a single person in music that can pull off the, pull off the pirate shirt. That, 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 that's a bygone era. 
yeah, the absolutely. <laughs> and and also the you know the, the embroidery up and his crotch and the whole thing is just like I... <laughs> so classic. And of course, there's London pants, you know, with the oh buttons. yeah, 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 right. sailor pants. Oh my God, this is Bob Marley. Who shot? Did the Annie shoot this? Annie, this is Annie's oh. picture of Bob Marley. Didn't need to know much more than that. No, I did. I didn't. I hadn't seen it before. It's the first time I've seen this image. Oh yeah, I love this yeah. picture. Yeah. I love this picture. Right, it's wonderful. So I mean. He how many how many rules is this image breaking? Do you think? Just jeez, well, let's see. We start out with no face, <laughs> right? I mean, you could get you you would like, but that's this... like uh, Brad. My, later on in Sports Illustrated, it's like the picture of Manute Bold. It's only his knees, right? But if if so, this might be what seventy five. This is color Rolling Stone, so I don't know. Well, this is uh, yeah, around that time, around that time. I think if you we make this, color, you know, even when I was first there in '74, mostly just on the cover, and then maybe one or two pictures inside. But we, by this time, were no longer printing on toilet paper. Right. That was a big plus. So if you make this picture ten years before, just ten, the decade before, for Life magazine, what's the response? This picture is not running. 10 years in, in Life magazine. In my period, no, they would not run this picture. First of all, they probably wouldn't do a story on Bob Marley. So, you know, you have to kind of back, back it up a bit. But I think this would be maybe a little too avant-garde for the Life magazine editors of the mid-60s. I mean... This was a Rolling Stone picture. You could, you could, you could flash forward to... Uh, USA Today in 1988, and they wouldn't run this picture. No, but this is a Rolling Stone picture. This is a perfect picture. That, that's what we were talking about earlier, the culture of the magazine. Each magazine had its own culture, and this was a classic, perfect picture for Rolling Stone. Okay, so what does, that mean? Other what does that mean to a photographer? What does it, I mean, well, I'm, I'm going you know, to Rolling market, Stone. I'm going to go see, I'm going to... See Lori Kurtakville at, at at Rolling Stone, and I need to put a portfolio together. But then I'm going to go down to U.S. News and World Report and sh and show my. Wh what do I do as a photographer? Well, sometimes the clever ones had two different portfolios. I wasn't that clever, Karen. We we both know this. Well, <laughs> but that would have been one way to do it. You would have had, because you'd have a, you know, your sort of avant-garde portfolio, which was more personal work and things that were, uh, you know, offbeat, but that you loved that was about your eye. And then you would have a more traditional portfolio so that when you went to traditional places, you would show that work that would appeal to them. I've always said that to my students. You have to think about who you're submitting this work to. And who, you know, what is that market? What kinds of work do they run? How far out have they gone? See, some photographers, like if you said Annie Leibovitz to do that, she wouldn't be able to have two different portfolios. She has her style and it will evolve. It will evolve as the, as the newsprint goes to glossy pages and the, from Rolling Stone to Vanity. But it will have... evolve, but she can't, she can't, uh, Say, oh, this is my tabletop photography. You know, this is my. There's some. Some of us aren't good enough to have that many uh, visions. We can only shoot how we see. Well, then you would organize your portfolio in a different fashion. So you would. I, I, I guarantee you, every portfolio I ever showed you was the same thing I show anybody else, whether it was Rolling Stone or, or. Uh, but did you lay Village them out? Voice. I mean, it depends on how you lay them out in the portfolio so that there's a, you know, look, all I know is when I see this picture, I know that it could have really only run in Rolling Stone at the time it did. That in that time frame, it would not have worked in any other publication that wasn't a music magazine. But today I could see it running in the LA Times. Oh, yeah, well, times are different now. Absolutely. 
everybody's got a better, a more educated and a more uh, open mind for things because it would also be in Instagram. Right? Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah. this is, a, I, under, I can recognize this guy. I can recognize this white guy in a suit. Yes. <laughs> Actually, I don't know who he is. Who is that, Karen? Oh God, I can't see. I can't see. So this is this um, is a famous photo essay. Is what this really is. Guy, some corporate. He's a suit. He's a suit. <laughs> One of many suits. He's the man. He's the suit. He's the he's, suit. He's the boss. Yeah. So this is an essay that I, I know it was. You really had a wonderful time working on this with Avedon and. The idea is that there's this uh, family, the ruling class, whatever you want to call them. Yeah, this was for the uh, Bicentennial. This was published in 1976, and it was um, about, it was for the Bicentennial, and it was called The Family. And um, it, it's about who runs the show. Right. Right? And and it was Jan's idea with, with, um, with Dick Avedon. Right. And it, it, I don't know if it originated with Abaddon. It might well have. And then he took it to Jan. Um, but it was the right... Neat, Rolling Stone was the perfect vehicle for it. And we gave it the whole issue. I mean, the whole issue was this this essay. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, was, it was the perfect moment in time, the perfect meeting of a, a subject matter, a photographer, and a publication to... Uh -huh to uh -huh. actually print it. it this, it's such a, it's, it's like, you know, a unicorn type of deal. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It was a lot of fun. That was a great opportunity to meet him and to be around him. And he was a very approachable and lovely guy. And, and uh, I felt fortunate to be part of the team that helped work on this. But, did, you, did you get a print out of the deal? I never did, but I have. You don't have an Avedon print in your house somewhere. No, I do not. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. It's crazy. I have an autographed issue. I have a lot of the uh, work prints. Right. But well, let me. See. Sometimes you just aren't as smart as you ought to be. Muskie and and um, McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy on the right. Wow. Muskie on the left. Now this is a pretty good spread. Yeah. Isn't it? I love their ties. It was one of the things that I liked so much. But as you can see, this is printed on newspaper print. I and mean, right. it's all tattered and, you know, it's just, <laughs> it was, you know, it was, no one thought that it should be, you know, this was before we had the good, before we had the good paper. No, it's literally newsprint, which means that's why it's turning yellow. Which is actually kind of wonderful about it. I like that quality. So I, old, something come out of the trunk, out of your mother's trunk. It's, 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 it's this, this double page spread. I could look at it for an hour. Yeah. There's so many good pictures. I think we only have two shots from this. Yeah. yeah. Where, this, where is, is this is the 10th anniversary issue, the last issue that I worked on uh, at Rolling Stone. I may, I may have done one um, after, but this was just a, this was Annie's section, and it was laid out to be kind of everybody falling on top of everything else, but these are all of Annie's work for the 10th anniversary. We had a lot of fun, she and I were off in a separate module right. out of the regular building. Right. Going through all of her pictures. We had a little office on Lexington and 50 some odd street, 56th street or something. Walk up. It was ridiculous. But they isolated us. Jan didn't want us around. <laughs> Are you, you're, I, I, didn't know, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. yeah. You weren't yeah. even in the same building? No, we had, we had been removed. We were That's in, actually kind of nice. I would have. Wonderful. No, yeah. it was. There was some a lot going on and, and it, it, we, were, we actually got more work done that way i'm sure i'm sure yeah uh is this, this annie's is, Arnold. is this annie's yeah. Or, yeah this is annie absolutely this was taken 
this is all from that um, uh, last of his uh, Mr. Uh, Olympia uh, contest that was in South Africa. And this guy went on to be the Hulk. Right. Lou Ferrigno. Lou Ferrigno. They were and roommates. So, yeah, they were buddies, and I think they're still buddies today. I wouldn't be surprised. But uh, how, uh, so you we, we mentioned George Butler earlier. George had. George you know, Butler a did the film of this event. George Butler filmed this uh, event and then brought it out as a documentary. Right. And, um, and, and Annie, it's a famous, it's a famous documentary. Um, yes. I forget the name of it right now. I got a, one of his pr prints around here from that. Um, so here's the deal. Does does George Butler do in his documentary uh, what Annie does in one single frame here? Can you compare the two? Is it fair? I don't think you can. I don't I don't think so because George has sound with his and he's interviewed them and you get to hear their voices and you see the preparation as they're all lathering themselves up with grease, you know, so their bodies will clean. This is, um, this is a little different to me. This is um, in many ways much more revealing because there isn't anything other than this picture and you get to supply the script. Well, that's, that's kind of what I'm saying without any of that other stuff. This this image seems. I mean, it it, it it's pretty much everything you ever need to know about Arnold Schwarzenegger, doesn't it? And Lou, who is not doesn't want to look at Annie. He he doesn't. You know he he's kind of. Uh, and he always came in second to Arnold. He was always in second place, and even always in the picture, in he's in second. Even place. in this picture, he's in second place. And his film career, second place. Everything. <laughs> everything. He, he always came in second. He always got the silver, never right. got the gold. I mean, I just think that that's something, you know, we, we don't have sound, we don't have motion as still photographers, but that doesn't mean we can. But when uh, you have a great picture, you get to write your own script. Right. You get to, you get to. Um, as the viewer, uh, the viewer, the viewer the gets, viewer. right. The viewer gets to bring their life experience and their, what they're that they bring that all to the table as well where maybe you can't do that you as know it's like if you're reading it when you're reading a great book you you decide in your head what everybody looks like as opposed to the film version yeah the movie right right so so this is how uh, arnold came to be because this is what i said to annie was we had to do dolly and uh this was in new york and we moved to New York, and I said, I think she, had her chest is just as big, or not bigger than Arnold's. And so <laughs> it was just a passing remark, you know, because I love Dolly. And she immediately ran with it and set up Arnold to be the prop. And this was before Conan the Barbarian or any of that stuff. So he was quite happy for any kind of uh, publicity, except he didn't get too much in this picture, except his body. And her chest is bigger than his. <laughs> <laughs> she was delicious. It took a long time for Dolly to get to be Dolly, by the way. <clears throat> that doesn't happen overnight. No. I mean, it's such a wonderful image. It's, and it's, 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 it, it, it kind of hints um, where uh, Annie herself is going to go as she goes on to Vanity Fair. Yes. Kind of. Yes. Right. So, so then this, this this is me at New York Magazine. New York Magazine, okay. Yes. Oh, and this is a Harry Benson picture. I love this picture. Of course it's a Harry Benson picture. I always send Harry for <laughs> people like this because he was like, you know, sending a, the most incredible pit ball. He was fantastic. He, I sent him to uh, all the other one, Mrs. Helmsley. Oh, there was always a list of them that I would send Harry to. And Jesus, she didn't have any underwear on. She was really quite special. Uh, is this her, her. Gloria Vanderbilt? Who is this? No, no, this is uh, Helen Gurley Brown. Oh, dear. The single girl. Oh, oh my dear. God, that's her bed. That's her bed. Oh, my God. No, this was, it's, it, this actually scared Harry, I think, but no. I. She had nothing on but that shirt. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful picture, and, you know, Harry has She's a just coming. showing that's, what she I'm could just, do. 
It was perfect. <laughs> Just perfect. And I always knew. So then this is Olivero Toscani. Uh-huh. Did the fashion. This is when I was doing fashion with Anna Wintour. And um, John Olson had a studio uh, at this point. He was doing a lot of commercial work on um, 20th Street uh, between 5th and 6th. And you could drive in because he did car shoots. So I knew you could drive in. And so I rented the studio and literally got, you know, the real cab driver, the so real is this, police is, people. This is John Olson who made the picture in Yeah, uh, in some way. But by that time, this is 1980-something, I am um, running things at, Lot, at New York magazine. Right. And so I knew we were going to do this kind of big, huge production. And I knew that was the studio to do because it was, you could enter from the street and I wanted in, I, you know, she had come over certain ideas and I said, Oh, okay. So I have to get a real checker cab and a real checker cab driver, which I did. So um, um, it's interesting, you know, you, <laughs> this is a relationship with this photographer that uh, lasted, I mean, this is 20 years later. I well, mean, I he sits at wonder. I love. I fell in love with Toscani. We we clicked immediately. Oh, I mean, right. Oh, sorry. Toscani is a photographer, but the yeah. relationship. Oh, you mean John Olson? Have, oh, right. It still goes on now. I still am in contact with John Olson. Right. We're still friends. Right. Absolutely. Um, tell me, tell me a little bit about doing a studio shoot in the eighties in New York. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I loved it. We had so much fun. And, I, it you know, was fun, right? It was oh, a, Lord. And it was just, you know, we had great models. Anna was ter terrific at picking the right models. And uh, it, it all just worked. It just worked. And, um, and my job was simple, was to find the right location, make sure everything ran smooth as silk, keep Toscani happy. You know, Anna, Anna always liked to be pouty. And I was the exact opposite. So they, that really helped the photographers. Of course, he could have cared less if she was bad. He didn't care. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was a big production. I always made sure there was plenty of food and everything was there. It was, you know, I had, there were assistants, there were hair and makeup and food galore and people to serve. And oh, Lord, and we could spend as much as we wanted. I mean, it was pretty much the perfect combination between doing great work and having a great time. Is that Absolutely. It was a joy. It was an absolute joy. I mean, we're, I mean, this was, these guys were actually driving this cab. I mean, this was the real cab driver. I know. I know. <laughs> this was his cab. I, know. I just rented it and had him drive it in. <laughs> Can you believe it used to only be a buck? 10 cents every additional nine tenths of a mile. I love them. Checkers. I love, I love that. I love the cab. I love it. And then this is a real car. I just, <laughs> you, did, you just pulled him off the street. Didn't you? You no, pulled him off I the just street. went to my local precinct and got a cop. And there was no <laughs> big deal. <laughs> How about, about police officer, Bob Scarantino. Bobby Scarantino from the old neighborhood. That's oh. right. <laughs> With Kathy Ireland, he was so excited to be there. I mean, it was, it was easy. Oh. I didn't have to go through PR. I bet he, I bet he lost the keys. I, of course he was easy. It was easy. He was having a great time. Oh, that's such a good photo. Isn't that? Yeah, so good. Wonderful. It's wonderful. So let's see. Is there another one in there? I don't know. Oh, yeah. This is when I hired this Dante. No, I, this is Dondi White. This is Dondi, the real Dondi right here. And Zephyr. Wow. wow. And then this guy, it, it, Negro, up here. But I built this set in, in John's with, you know, just the white fiberboard, right? And then we we'll let the boys go crazy. And then Absolutely. they just made it happen. And they were having so much fun. And Toscani fell in love with them that he hired Dondi to come up and, and Zephyr, and they came to his studio in, <laughs> they had one of those studios at Carnegie Hall. Oh, they did the walls. Fantastic, huh? Yeah, it's wonderful. 
Oh, they were so much fun. Dondi didn't like to have his face shown much. He's a real fireman, thank you. <laughs> oh, Lieutenants, right? Yeah. Why not? Fourth grade, another one, fourth grade, Jeff Brockner. Fireman, fourth grade. Oh, my God. Two fire lieutenants. Mr. Martinez and Mr. Lola Jr. I just so you, went to the local fire station. You didn't have to go through the mayor's office? You didn't have no, to? No, I don't. I've never did that. You didn't have to take out an insurance no, writer? No, I didn't and, have to take out an insurance call. I just had to tell them what time to show up. Oh, things were so much easier. It was so much easier. I got the guardian angels. Thank you. That wasn't hard. How about no. this? I got the Yankees. Get I got Surround Ron Davis. The, surround the you know the catcher and the pitcher. Really? Jeez. Uh, the phone books are the phone books are just uh, fantastic, right? It's the little things. It's the little things that matter. No Apple box need apply. Yeah. This was another wonderful one. I can't I'm trying to think of which photographer shot this. A wonderful fashion photographer shot this. But it's a beautiful picture. She had great taste, exquisite taste. So these are, th there's Artie and that's uh, Larry Downing. And that's right. That was at a White House uh, correspondence dinner. Douglas Kirkland. Douglas Kirkland and, and uh, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Uh, me shooting at the uh, 88. Um, Is that 88? Yeah, 88. That's in Atlanta. Democratic Democratic Convention, and uh, on board, uh, <laughs> uh, this is uh, in China, traveling with Mark Peters, and we met this professor, and we were traveling first class, and we always had the Jack Daniels, because he said to me, Mark Peters said, it'll kill the hepatitis in the cracks, it'll kill the hep in the cracks of the teacups, so I said, you bet, and he had never had Jack Daniels, and he thought it was fantastic. And then this is a cover that they did for me at Newsweek. Me on oh, the cover. Good stuff. So this is Artie's work. You want to tell us about this series? Well, this was a thing called Choose Me, and Arthur came to me. This was during the 88 conventions, they running for president. And Arthur came and said he had an idea that he wanted to shoot everything on a two and a quarter because they never know when you're taking the picture because I'm looking down and there's no red light. And I said, brilliant, do it. And that's how this started. And we did it in black and white. And at first time they went to lay something out, they didn't quite, the senior editor in charge of Nation didn't understand and he cropped a picture. And I went downstairs and closed the door in his office. I waited till everybody left. And then I closed the door and I said to him, you don't get to crop my pictures. You don't get to crop this work ever. And if you have to crop it, then you can't have it. I'm taking it away from you. So just to be clear, this isn't an art director. This is somebody who's technically hired. This is over, yes, an assistant managing editor. Right, okay. <laughs> assistant managing editor in charge so of the nation section. Oh. It would come over from Time Magazine. Well, at least you didn't embarrass the young lad. <laughs> no, I did not do it in front of other people. If you're gonna, if you're going to administer punishment, you must do that in private. You must never do that in public. Oh. You can never win that argument. So he agreed? But behind he, closed he, doors, behind closed doors. Well, I, I told him that if he had a problem with that, and if he insisted on cropping this picture, I would take it away from him. And that I would take my argument directly across the hall, which is where Mr. Richard M. Smith, editor-in-chief, resided. And it was the one who had hired me with the understanding that he and I had that only he could say no to me. Right. And I would have to take his no, even if I just decided to fight with him about it a lot. So, so I said, I think what we need to do maybe is go across the hall if you want to pursue this. Or you could run it uncropped and, have a, and become a star because everybody's going to want to know where the hell did this come from? Right. And so our, be the first of the days that you'll get to run. And so we did not have to go across the hall. It was probably so best. Wisdom on his. Yeah, it was best for him. 
it was best for him. And he knew that. Yeah. So this, this is on my wall. Yeah, this is a nice one. Um, I mean, they're all nice. Gary Hart. Gary Hart. And I recognize. Everybody always thinks that's me in the back, but it's not. No. But no. Um, I. This is a, this is in somebody's house and it's like a small fundraiser or meet, but she looks like a campaign person that I actually ran yeah. back in the day. She's not a, she's not a. No, and this is right around the time he said, catch me if you can. Right. Uh, about right. his girlfriend. Right. But it's a wonderful I mean, picture yeah, of Gary Hart. Yeah. A wonderful picture. It certainly is. These were all wonderful because the subject did not know when you were taking the picture because so when you got all doing 35 and you bring it up to your face and the red lights on the tv they give you that smile right here they had no idea so uh already shooting with a roll of flex so it's a twin lens that is reflex. either that or a Hasselblad I can't remember which one he had no it's a rolly it's a rolly yeah it's this wonderful. is uh, Bruce Babbitt he was briefly flirting with the presidency. Senator from Arizona. Yep. Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson. I always like that white hand. So did Arthur. Yeah, it's nothing. None of nothing is an accident in these pictures. We should probably nothing. make that clear. I mean, these are very uh, studied moments that Arthur is going after. Absolutely. Bob Dole with the pencil in his hand, which was the way he was able to handle the fact that he was paralyzed. He always had the pen in his hand because his, his, hand, wouldn't, his hand wouldn't open. Is what His, his hand was no. permanently clenched fist. That's correct. From World right. War II uh, injuries. That's right. I always love this one. We laid the book out uh, in order in which they uh, dropped out. So it's- it, Oh, and, right, um, right. On each picture, it's the date they entered and the date they deceased. They were deceased, right. and that's how we ran it. So, um, George this w. guy, this guy George made w. made it to the end. This is in the last month of the campaign. Yes, it is. I remember this because we're in Sioux Falls, I believe Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and it was at a, a feedlot, and they allowed us to get on top of the building behind him. And it wasn't very stable. So I remember almost like falling, <gasps> falling through the roof of a of livestock building. <sighs> but the hay bales were nice. The hay bales were good. Ours are, just, ours are the best spot. Uh, Artie, Artie was smart enough not to climb to the top of the building. <laughs> oh, hold on one second. If you hit the pause. I have to call you back on being interviewed. <laughs> Bye. Hey, sorry about that. No, that's okay. And and here's the <laughs> here's the Democrat front runner. I spent a lot oh, of time with him. This, know, was, this was not a good day for Mike Dukakis. No, it was not good. It was not a good day. And and uh, so stupid. He did a lot of so his his team did a lot of stupid things. And these this is the same stuff. team that was you know. Uh, managing harvard law for i don't know how many years so take that yeah they did not know politics they didn't know politics they did not know politics they did not know a good photo op oh. and him behind the gun was not the option that was well then they put him in a helmet though too on this helmet too oh, oh geez jeez it was terrible oh yeah this was the problem this was a problem and the shot from the back would have been on the on all the boxes, so it could have been even worse. Yeah, this is a presidential campaign that could afford to put flowers on one side of the podium to block the box their candidate was standing on, but not the other right. side of the podium. Things like that. I know it was just, yeah, it was just amazing. And then they politely asked the photographers not to shoot from the other side of the podium. Oh, okay, we <laughs> won't do that then. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> ain't going to happen, right? Yeah. So, the next picture is perfect because it's Robin's answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so you don't want me to go over there? Okay. So you, uh, so you paired up 
Arthur Grace with Robin Williams to, uh, to uh, you know, kind of a match made in heaven. Two funny guys. And two hairy two guys, smart, too. Two smart, funny, and um, the beginning of a 19-year dear friendship that the yeah. three of us had. I mean, Artie and I are still friends, but that started uh, uh, something that's totally unexpected. You never think you're going to get to be close to a celebrity that you meet at an event or whatever. And somehow it just, it took on a whole other life and it became part of our lives. So um, Lucky you, to have you assigned, that. you assigned Arthur Grace to photograph Robin Williams. When I he did. Was, he was they just, were... I mean, the HBO documentary that, Arthur had a big hand. Well, they couldn't have done the thing without Arthur, but um, you can see that that Arthur is there as Robin Williams is just starting to take off. And so how did that story come about in okay. Newsweek? Here's how it came about. They were about, this was prior to the release of Good Morning Vietnam. Right, David right. Demby, who was the movie critic in those days for us, for Newsweek, had seen the film and felt this was the breakout movie for Robin's career. So it was decided that they would do a big cover story and Robin was beginning to do a series of one man shows right. across the country that was going to end at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York. So I was asked to send a photographer. And so I thought of Arthur immediately because you know, Artie had done stand-up when he first got back from Vietnam in Boston. Anyway, so, and he's so funny, and he's just one of the funniest people I know and so smart. And I thought that they would be perfect together because part of being a good assigner is to be sort of a matchmaker, you know. You're making little marriages. Some of them don't last longer than a few days or a few hours, but it's part of the process of making who will the subject relate well to? How will this go? What can the photographer and the, how, how will they mesh? Make a marriage. Ayenta. And uh, so I uh, sent Robin and Arthur, Arthur out there and they began to go across the country together and it, they were just instantly bonded. And each could crack the other one up. And Arthur kept talking about about Hefe, which was Arthur's name for me. And Hefe did this, and Hefe knows something. Hefe is the one who figured this out. Hefe, Hefe, Hefe. So one day as they're traveling across the country, I get a phone call in the office, and it's a person uh, uh, pretending to be Danny Ortega. <laughs> and um, The president of Nicaragua, okay. Right, the Sandinistan president of right, Nicaragua, okay. or the communist president of Nicaragua. And he says to me, El Jefe. And he just goes into this whole rap as this, you know, the Commandante, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I know immediately who it is. And I know why he's doing it because he's, he's intent on seducing me, you know, emotionally so that I will pick only the best pictures and he can have a say in it and the whole thing. I mean, I know he's a movie star. I get it. And um, so I'm laughing and <laughs> not, not your first rodeo it was not my first rodeo. He did not know that he should have picked that up from Arthur. But anyway, so when it's, he's run the, his riff and I said, how sweet of you to call me. Da, da, da. Do you think I could speak to Arthur I said to him for a minute? I just want to talk to him about the film. Okay. He goes, oh yeah. I think it's on the phone. I said to him, Artie, don't let him ever do that again. Okay. You can tell him. Because he had said, you know, you, then when he stopped being Spanish in New Mexico, whatever, said, and he said, he said, you have to come to the show, and, you know, I really want to meet you in F.A., and da, da, da. And I said, well, I would, that would be lovely. And I, you know, I would like to do that. So I got already on the phone. I said, don't, don't ever let him do that again. And I will come to the show after I'm done, and I don't want to meet him till I'm finished, and I don't want him to call here again. And if I go to the show, it'll be because I want to. And whether or not he wants to see me backstage, I imagine will be determined by what pictures we run. But that's just fine. Okay? And we're not going to go there. And you can tell him I said that. 
by all means, tell him I said that. He goes, well, sure. I said, I'll know if you have. I, I'm sure. I'm sure Arthur did. I mean, he did. No, he did. He said, "Hef, I said you can't call her anymore until she's done with the story." <laughs> and he loved that. To tell you the truth, he thought it was great. And I did meet him after the show, and this was taken during the show at the Met. No, and I did go, and I took a date. I took a date, and I, <laughs> I said to the date, "You can't come backstage. I'm sorry, but you can come to the show with me, but you can't come backstage." <laughs> And then we all went with uh, to dinner. And that was the beginning of it. And it didn't end until he died. Yeah. <laughs> such a lunatic. Such a wonderful human being. So much fun. So bright. Oh, my God. See, only Arthur could get into places like that with him. And he let Arthur see everything. So after this, Arthur, that's when he decided to do the book on comedians. Oh, when, oh, yeah, when, when after Robin died. No, the. Uh, oh, the, comedians, it was yeah. separate, yeah. yeah. But I was saying the, <clears throat> the, the Robin Williams book he did, he did right. after. Right. Right. This is another. This is more Arthur's of Arthur's, book. yeah. He did this on the Street Kids of Seattle. Seattle, okay. Yeah. That's where that was. This is his, he would, did Poland a lot. So he knew Lech Walesa very well. And you can see this is probably with that same Roly, and it's uh -huh. in the same style as the, the Choose Me. Yes. Yeah, the workers, the Polish yeah. workers. Uh, oh, Annie did this for me at Newsweek. Stay. Really? Yeah, and then after she did this, um, What's her name? Uh, who was the editor of Vanity Fair? Oh, the blonde one. Tina Brown. Tina Brown rewrote her contract and specifically put in there that she couldn't work for me. Because yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, I, I wondered about it that. Her, it wasn't in her contract, so I hired. I asked her to do Sting. Right. And she did, and she did this and a bunch of other ones. All the girls wanted to come see this because, uh, of course, a number of them he did not have placed his hands where they were, so he was full naked. And all, none of the guys wanted to come in and see the show, but every woman at Newsweek did. It was fantastic. And when you talk and about the show, it. you're talking about the screening of the images for the, the screening of the right. images. Excuse me, absolutely. I'm speaking in a vernacular, which is probably not fair. That's okay. I speak. I speak both languages. Okay, you speak, you speak you. photo and you speak words. I only speak photo. So that's the, okay. You can translate my photos for the, for the word people. That's your job. One of your jobs. Anyway, so Annie did this for me when I was at Newsweek. And then after that, Tina Brown got wind of it. And, <laughs> and she wasn't allowed to shoot for me anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure she was pissed. Oh, yes. This is Peter Turnley, one of my favorite Turnley pictures. I, lovely ballerina in Moscow. He had the multiple entry visa into Moscow. He could come and go. Didn't need yeah, that was, a, that was a rare thing. Right. And this is in a uh, synagogue in Russia. Soviet Union at the time. Yeah. 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 And Gorbachev, who liked Peter, always could see him in the crowd and go, Peter! This is, uh, this is a May Day, probably, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was a May yeah. Day celebration in Moscow. They used to do those right. Now yeah. they're kind of kind of weird, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is this is really a good picture. Yeah, this is, is this Turner. Romania or yes, it's Romania. Just after they killed, they're about to kill Ceausescu. This is Romania. That's retail level politics, in the Romanian style. Romanian style. Well, he was. <laughs> Really horrible. He was a terrible, terrible person. Sure. But you can see there's a cognac. Uh, uh, somebody's drinking cognac out of that glass there. That's I, right. I just, I love that. I love the the guy with the pistol and the. I mean, it's just. It's really, really, and the guy with the pistol is just not trusting any single thing that's in that room. You don't know what. Yeah, you you don't know what's going. But the people are so nonchalant about him that you're like, okay, maybe you know. Right. But I mean, I would be nervous if I was the guy reading and that guy was behind me with that pistol. That's that. That's why I'm saying it's 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 counterintuitive. Like, you know, it's like yes. it's like in, it's like uh, uh, 
hey joe can you can you i think the lights over can you move over here uh, you know yes just... <laughs> and the brocade chairs and the whole thing this was a thing that uh peter did brocade chairs are great no this i just that this is this this is soviet style that you'd see absolutely in every every soviet bureaucrat's office in every uh pilot right. state they had this is the same furniture and there's another guy over here on the far corner with also with another rifle you yeah. just see his hand in the tip yeah. yeah there's guns everywhere yeah so this is this uh the, this series peter did peter turnley came to me and said he wanted to do a story on refugee camps around the world uh for the year-end issue and i said absolutely just go and do it and then i got in you know got a lot of pushback and i just said i don't care we're going to run these pictures in the year-end issue, and they did. Good. Oh, there's the, there's. There's the brothers. I think that's Peter to the right, and David in the middle. But uh -huh. I could be wrong. I Let think me so. Take a look. You think that's the right way? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I can never tell, but um, I think you're right. I think that is Peter. And this is Tiananmen Square. This, this is, is Tiananmen during, Square. Yeah. Of course, what was funny was they they showed up that day in the same outfits without knowing, right? right. And uh, and they were on the ladders. And what Peter told me later is everybody, all the Chinese guys, turned around and thought they look exactly alike, which was so funny because, of course, we all think all Asians look exactly alike. Right. Right? We can't tell them apart, and they couldn't tell the brothers apart. It was just really more than they could. Uh, this guy's wearing here, he's wearing a China America thing, which was, I think, from the day in the life of China, but maybe I'm wrong. You Who could knows? be right. You could be right. So this was, this was, um, so that there was a, a was Soviet, uh, Soviet Chinese uh, summit uh, meeting. Summit, and it was re really important uh, because they had been basically not talking to each other for about 30 years. And this was a big deal, and Gorbachev came to Beijing, and then the students uh, ruined all their big plans. And Well, it, the Chinese government uh, got in the way of one of the Politburo members who was very favored by the students, and somehow there was an upheaval in the power structure, and he was tossed, and right. that's when it all went right. down. And here's Charlie's picture, famous picture. So we just lost Charlie maybe six or seven months ago. And oh, no. um, so this was, this was three, uh, two other photographers, Charlie and two other photographers made this image. And Stuart um, Franklin and uh, Jeff. Um, Widener. Uh, yeah, Widener. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, as you know, it's a pretty good image. I think it is. And, the, and how we got it is quite amazing. And how it's, we got the film is quite amazing. Yeah, it was, it was a dicey situation. I, you know, we won't, but basically, uh, you know, Charlie got the knock on the door about three minutes after this image was taken. And uh, right. the film went into a, a canister, film canister, where you kids, you know, like to keep your weed these days and a plastic bag into the toilet. And it stayed there, I think, for two days before he could manage to smuggle it to the AP Bureau or right. was it the U.S. Embassy? I don't, I don't remember exactly. but I know we might have taken it out of the U.S. Embassy. They were uh, definitely moving things out of the U.S. Embassy for us uh, as uh, it, through State Department patches. So was... yeah and uh, so basically it was the um, you know the diciest situation you can imagine just wasn't was it was a bad time but and did you pictures. know that time lost Stuart franklin's picture i don't think well I, you know i i know they lost it i know they paid for it and uh, so what Stuart franklin the magnum photographer had this picture in time magazine and he didn't have as much glass as charlie but he had a good frame but it was really blown up really beautiful like grainy just kind of there's something beautiful good. about it but supposedly time lost that picture, but you know, I think there was, I think there was uh, somebody in the picture department that was making a, a collection of images like that at that time. 
Um, uh. There, uh, there, Terry Ash, ha he shot uh, uh, Ollie North swearing in. I don't know if he used a four by five. I think he used an eight by 10. Beautiful image behind Senator Inouye swearing in Ollie North. And it was an eight by 10 in this Senate room, hearing room. And it was so beautiful, the original chrome. And that went missing at the, about the same time. So uh -huh. I think there was, I think that. That's a nice job. Yeah. Don't you think? I mean, yeah. nobody, we never found out who did it, but somebody was doing something. Hanky. Yeah. This is a hell of a shot. Peter's. Yeah. Who shot this? Peter? Peter Turner. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think you're right. No, I think I you're think right. Yeah. That kind of tells you everything. Yeah. And then these are the tear sheets. Uh, are both these, this is Jeff's, is it? This says Jeff from AP. This is yeah. his. And this is the night before, this yeah. is the night before the, the mass extinction happened. Or the night before, this is like early in the night. They started shooting at daybreak into the crowds. Right. So this is uh, Luke's picture here at the top of the, I think both of those are Luke's. And that's when the shooting started about six in the morning, right? Right. So here's, an, <laughs> here's a nicer picture here. Me and this Mike, is wonderful. You and me and Mike. Yeah. I love the picture. I knew what he was doing. And I kept saying to him, I don't care what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And I am squeezing your 2% body fat body as tight as I can. You're a little bit starstruck. I mean, totally. Robin, Robin Williams real wishes, wishes. Oh, wishes. Yeah. Walter. Is this Walter? Yes. Yeah, Walter. This is Walter. Yeah. Walter Eos. And this is probably Olympic. Walter Eos is just one of, one of my absolute favorite photographers to work with. This was something Wally would come, he came to me with an idea. He wanted to do these particular number of athletes in this kind of a very stylized fashion. And, uh, you know, I always said to him, sure. <laughs> and then sometimes the editors would get, oh, you always give him, I said, I'll give Arthur, I always will give Walter anything he wants. And the only other person like that is Brian Blanker. It would just be like, you want to do that? Fine. Okay. Next. So it, 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 so you're at Sports Illustrated now. You got a pretty good crew of photographers, but what? you got two. You got Walter and you got uh, um, a number of them. Brian, who are kind of have the golden. They've got the golden ticket, right? As far as I'm concerned, they have the absolute golden ticket at yeah. any time. This is a one that Walter did. This and is this is uh, it's classic. Yeah, it's so good with all the mirrors. And then of course, you know, you have to, we went in and, and took care of this stuff in Photoshop, but it was the way to do Michael. He right. loved it. See, this is the kind of stuff we would do with Michael. He couldn't get enough of it. Right. It was so unusual. He loved Walter. Walter could do no wrong. He would get up from a nap for Walter. And he liked to nap. He slept a lot. He had as to. Like, but it, as long as you keep, making images like this it's the smart play any 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 anybody's going to say yes because that's right it it's increases the their value it increases that's their right. brand it increases their legendhood status i mean absolutely you, you can't just do it on the court right no no and this, oh, is, this is walter, walter. Yeah. Yeah. this was that whole series oh this is the <laughs> same series same series Joe, Montana. God, it was so much fun to meet these people. I, you know, I'm a big sports person, so it was fabulous for me. Oh, it's so good. Isn't it good? Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. Magic. Is this Walter? Who's, who's Walter. The, yeah. It's Walter. Fuji, man. Yeah, of course. That's good. Walter. This is Walter, I know. I don't remember who the ass is. Oh, it's the great guy who did the, uh, the jump, uh, long jump. Johnson? Michael Johnson? Michael Johnson? That's it, I think. That's I think right. he always wore gold shoes. That's what's confusing me. I don't... These are gold, you can see, in the back. 
Yeah, but I, I I don't know. Oh, you mean solid gold? Yeah, I think that I don't. Maybe. I don't know the answer, but I know he was a long jump person, a three jump guy. You know. He was a sprinter and a long jumper, I believe. Yeah. Um, I think it's Michael Johnson. See, now this is one where you didn't. For me, I wouldn't have had to run the face. Right. They did, but I I love this picture that Brad Trent did so much. Who shot that? Brad Trent. Brad Trent. Yeah. It's Sports Illustrated. That's when I started using Brad Trent. He was a young photographer at the time. But you didn't need his face. Right. You don't need the face. Jeez. They have to get so literal with us sometimes. I know. It's, so, it's just such a shame. Oh, well, this is, uh, if you want to get into this, this was a thing I did. Uh, after I left magazines, I started doing films. And, uh, and, and I did a big production thing for the... Uh, the Tech Museum in San Jose every year, I did a three hour uh, visual presentation that ran uh, through their, mo their fundraising dinner with 1500 of the grand poobahs of Silicon Valley would come and that, that's how the university, that's this how was, the museum your, raised the money. This was your dinner show, Karen? Yeah, it's my dinner show that ran three hours. Oh, and dear. Some of it was, you know, I would, I had, you know, I would have beautiful scenics and stuff like that because uh, everybody let me use their pictures for free. It was one night only, and then I erased everything. So I had access to the geographic, and Franz Lanting let me have everything, and Seth, and so Resnick, and everybody else. But this was a part of the dinner, which was serious part, which was about child soldiers. And I had done a number of uh, images that I had collected uh, that photographers had made, photojournalists, and then um, <clears throat> Stephen it's Chang. The, it's, it's the artwork of the child soldiers and the, the former children, child soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Former rescued child soldiers. And Stephen yeah. Shanks turned me on to this because he helped start a school in Uganda right. for these children to help bring them back to childhood. Right. And these were their drawings. Yeah, that's rough. And so there's this next little series or the, the drawings from these children. And so I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through those, but no. I do. Um, whoops. So that's what that is. And that was another way to tell stories. Right. And that's one of the few times I didn't use photograph. Right. But you couldn't quite do anything more powerful than their drawings. No. And that's, I mean, and that's, so powerful in itself it's not always for the photography so now that brings you to now which is where i am now as a coach and a mentor and a teacher for um at the city university of new york in the photography department at the grad school of journalism and how many students do you have this semester this semester i have 11, 11. i do one-on-one -on -one. i do everything one-on-one -on -one. Uh, and the semester before i had 14 the first semester I had five, then it went to eight, and from eight it went to 14. I could have done more, but 14 was an awful lot last semester. So this semester I decided to, would be, uh, I thought 10, and then I got 11. And I could have had 12, but I thought, no, I'll stick to right where I am. So how, um, on a scale to one, of one to 10, do they know how lucky and blessed they are to have you as a as a mentor? Yes, they do. Do they? Yep. You they say do. nine or ten? What do you say? Oh, I don't know. You talk to one of them. You tell me. You talk. Well, to she them. seemed like she seemed like a smart one. I don't know about the rest. <laughs> <laughs> they all tell me that they are. They feel blessed. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. I don't, I can't even add up but the But you know years. what? It's mutual. It's mutual. You have to believe me when I tell you that. It's mutual. I learn from them as well. I may teach them a bit, but trust me, I learn a lot. I learn a great deal. Honest engine. So that's, Terrible that's life. another, that's another, that's kind of been your modus operandi from the start. I was mentored by the best in the world. So how could I not return the favor? It's how I always have looked. I mean, all but my you've career, been doing that all the time. All the time. But it's how it started. So if 
the, you know, it's, I never considered doing it any other way. It never occurred to me that there was a different way to do it. But maybe you, that's the only way to, maybe that's the only way you can do it. I mean, that's just like a photographer. It's, they, I they, shut that light off because it was just driving me crazy. Okay. Jeez, it's too bright. It was okay when the sun was out, but the sun no, is still I, out now. I see. We've we've talked a long time, so I, I just uh, we're always going to do it for just an hour, and it doesn't quite work out that way, does it? I know. I mean, listen. It's it to me. It's like uh, it's a it's it's a treat for me, and we talk a lot, anyways. And I know most of these stories, but I still like to hear them. So <laughs> <laughs> tell me that one again. <laughs> you see, it's a, it's a good story and a good picture. It's it's you wanna you wanna experience yeah. it again. That's, that's I think there were some good pictures in there that we looked at tonight. Yeah, I, I think there are a couple keepers. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, and I know you refuse to take credit for anything that any photographer has ever accomplished. Um, but I think uh, I think that. Uh, that you were you 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 paved the way for a lot of people to do their best and greatest work and um they probably wouldn't have probably wouldn't have been as successful not you know not not in your life magazine days you know that that was your when you well, were starting was, out yeah. but, but later I on glad. i don't i don't think and you'll i know you'll disagree yeah. with me on this but and i'll just one serious comment I don't think Annie Leibovitz is Annie Leibovitz without you. Oh, I don't agree. I, yeah, I know I, you. I said that. I said that. But you're wrong, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I think a, a number of people who were so important in her career. I'm not saying I wasn't in part of that, but there was Bea Feitler, there was Jan, there was Roger Black. There were a ton of people that made you know, Susan Sontag, there were a number of individuals who came through her life at various times in her growth that made her better every time. And she was, she's a complex and interesting woman, but she learned, she was open to good ideas. She never that's that's, down that's a lesson idea. to learn right there. That's a lesson. She never turned down a good idea. Yeah. And then she could take it and run with it. Right. So, you know, her mother was as essential as everybody else in this. Sure. So I, I'm flattered by that. But, you know, we were, I was, it was the right time for me and the right time for her. And then you move on. You know, and my what I learned from Annie, I took and used as I went along. And then I learned things from other people. I mean, that's the whole process. When you work with a photographer and it's a really good photographer, you're helping them get an opportunity. And then they're teaching you when you're standing on the set, watching them work. You're learning all the time. If you're smart, you're a sponge and you're just picking it up all the time. That's a that's a curious term, you know. I, I always I always think that uh, you know, there's photographers that talk a lot, there's photographers that shoot a lot, but the ones that are really good, they kind of just sit around and watch and absorb things, and then they make their pictures. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that's what photographers and photojournalists have photographers have in common, right there. That's correct. Photographers and editors. That's right. And then you can translate these crazy things we come up with. That's right. <laughs> and, and can encourage you or say, let's guide that over this way a little bit. Yeah. Let's just back that down a step or two. Just, just, can we, just can tap we, the brakes. Could you run that, back? Could you, <laughs> run that by me one more time? <laughs> that oh. was could you run that by me one more time now and just see if I understood that correctly? <laughs> well, my brain is going, whoa, <laughs> where's the brake pedal? <laughs> I didn't use the brake pedal very often. No, I know you didn't. 
I don't use like the that. gas. The, I like the gas. Yeah. I like the gas pedal. I don't like the brake pedal. And yeah. I, you know, my students sometimes will say to me, well, now, do you think it's a problem if, you know, if this is, you know, this isn't quite perfect or this is, hell no, I'll say, I don't think that's a problem at all. You know, there's no problems. It's just get over it, you know? So it's not perfect. What can you do next time? If you take this idea, what could you do next time with this idea to make it better? That's what okay. you do all the time. Every okay. time you want something and it hasn't come out quite right, then you look at it and you go, okay, well, what do I have to do to make it perfect? What do I have to do to improve upon this? And let's go out and shoot that again and, and learn from your mistakes. That's all. Okay. Jeez. So let me, let me, let me just ask you one more question. We'll wrap up. I promise. Yes, it's almost dinner time. Yeah. You've, uh, so go back to that Linda Ronstadt shoot. Okay. We saw two images from there. And one's the cover and the other's a double truck. Beautiful, beautiful image. Neither one of those images are anywhere near perfect. All right. There's technical flaws. There's, you know, there's the lighting could be better. Uh, the color balance, whatever it is, they're not perfect. They're not anywhere near perfect. And that's something that is a major factor in like the, how good an image is today the post-production, the, oh, the, right. all this type of stuff. Because they can fix everything. Well, they have the ability to fix everything. But what you said, as, you're, as I'm thinking about this, you, you always said, you're, you're talking about the idea. You're screaming out in the street now at 7 o'clock. No, oh, sorry. Kept you too long. No, I, no, it's okay, but it's just what's happening. I'm not going to well, play my gong tonight. I, I, I know you want to get your gong out there and join the party. Well, I only have two minutes. <laughs> really? They cut you off minutes. at two minutes? No, that's it. it you wanna, we only do it for two minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm sorry. I no, just, that's okay. But can you hear? I can barely hear them. Barely. Yeah, I can hear it now. It's building. Yeah, I can definitely hear it now. Makes me cry. Well, you always make me cry, Karen, so it's fair play. <laughs> What's it? I mean, it's the idea, right? It's the idea, and it's what you see. Oh, that's a, I look at those two pictures of Linda's, and, I, and whatever flaws are there, they're technical, they don't count for shit. They don't mean anything. You can't even see that when you see those pictures. And anybody who's going to focus on that, I say to them, well, you go bite me. You know, I mean, really, yeah, geez, let me see you try to do that. You know, come on. Sometimes stuff is too polished. Well, that's kind of, I'm wondering if your students, you know, they see all these examples of the perfectly everything you know the mary poppins of I photography try to break them of that. i try to break them of that practically perfect in every way um practically perfect is you know <clears throat> do you know there's a, a thing and uh, i think it was in japan i think i'm right here <clears throat> there's a form of weaving called ikat which is very beautiful it's a very complicated weaving and they uh i read this that they uh the 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 master weavers automatically put a flaw in when they're threading the machine because only gods can be perfect. Well, it's the Japanese pottery too, that you just, yes. you just form the pot to its, uh, so it can do its job. To job. The, and right. you don't like add to it. It's just like, this is why it exists. And right. I've started to notice that the flaws in my images I, 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 those are the things that keep me coming back. The things that I think are flaws, I should say, are the things that actually give, give the image some lasting power. Absolutely. I try to tell them that I try, you know, well, they should I, listen you know, to you. I re they do. I reward <laughs> them for what's done well that day. And I'll say to them, no, I put this up here because I wanted to talk to you about it because the idea is terrific. Now, you didn't pull it off quite right, but here's what worked in this picture and what's not working. 
So when you go back and you encounter this situation again, think about what didn't work. Now, if this is a still life that they're doing inside because they're locked in their house, I'll say them and I'll go back and do that again and change this and try this and do, you know, take, get off the choke chain, right? Let your imagination run wild. Be silly. Do something that seems completely wrong. It may turn out to be right. You don't know. You need to stretch all the time. You need to stretch your brain all the time. That's yeah. How you do better yeah. Annie took no prisoners. Yeah. She took, she never, she hated being boxed in. She couldn't, like, you know why I love Arthur? I told him this once. I said, you know why I picked you out of all the time photographers I could have hired? I could have was allowed to take one photographer from time when I went to Newsweek. That was the deal. And I chose Arthur. Why? He reminded me of Annie. She couldn't stand being behind the rope. Arthur hated it, despised it, was always trying to find a different angle, a different place to shoot from. And that's what I was looking for. Plus, which I thought if I put him in the Washington bureau, it would shake everybody up. And it did. Wally got it. He loved it. I mean, because he didn't give, you know, good. never going to rattle that Marine. And besides which, Arthur was a Marine. Right. Once well, a Marine, always a Marine. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. I just it's just such a, a, a treasure to, to speak with you. And I just thank you for, for your work. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. I like yeah. doing this face to face. It's really nice. Yeah, it is nice. I like so, it. Um I'll talk to you soon and uh I'll see you soon too. Okay. Bye, thank sweetie. You. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.